Welcome. If you are hearing my voice, you are in pre-show banter. I'm Ian Meyer from Black Hills Information Security, and we've got a great webcast today. We're going to spend the next couple hours hanging out with folks from Europe, our, our brethren, our security partners, folks that are also doing great cybersecurity work on uh, the other side of the pond, if you will. Now, not just the UK, because I know that's always often safe for the UK, but we're really focusing on Central Europe and a lot of countries that maybe you're curious about. What goes on there? What kind of security challenges do they face? And uh, we want to have a more kind of global reach and, and understand that. So this is pre-show banter. So if you're looking for what I just said, we're going to go live in about... Uh, 30 minutes, but actually about 26 minutes. But you show up early, so we show up early, so you show up early, and if you've been on our webcast before, you know the drill. So today, we are going to be over in the Anti-Siphon Discord. If you've never been over to the Anti-Siphon Discord, no problem. You can go there now. You can go to discord.gg forward slash anti-siphon, A-N-T-I-S-Y-P-H-O-N, right there on the screen. Thank you, Ryan. And you can join us and get involved in the chat and ask questions and uh, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll drop some gifts, we'll have some memes, we'll have a good time, right? Because we've got folks from all over the world today. And uh, hey, everybody, how's everybody doing? Hey. Hi. Excellent. Yeah. Hello. So, Hi. Hi. So while, while we're pre-show bantering and warming up, what time is it where everyone is? So Sam, what time is it where you are? It is. I'm going to do this in like, you know, this European way of talking about time. It's 15.35. 15. Does anyone going. know what that means? So uh, is 25 that, to uh, 3, 3, 30 p.m.? Yeah, it's 25 to 4 in the afternoon. There you go. 25 to 4. Okay. Very good. Uh, let's yeah. take a look here over there. Uh, I've got we've got John over there, one of our fine BHIS brethren, our our, our person in Europe, and uh, Klaus. What time is it? Yeah. What, what time is it where you all are? Yeah, uh, sixteen sixteen thirty six now. The the minute just changed. Right, so we're or or for, or four thirty six. I wonder how far we're gonna go that way. Uh, all right. Not, not not anymore. I think. I think that's it. Yeah. That's it. Okay, we got the farthest. So Lars. What time is it? Yeah, you? I'm in uh, I'm in Denmark, uh, so it's the same time zone as uh, Klaus and John. Uh -huh. So it's uh, 1636. The computer says. Okay, that is a yeah. lot of Lego that you've got there. That is mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, it's not my bragging rights. No. No, <laughs> it's not it's because uh, I've been married for quite a while. Okay. And I thought I was the biggest nerd. <laughs> But I wasn't. <laughs> you were. Yeah. So this actually, this is uh, my setup here today. Mm -hmm. uh, it's my wife's uh, dedicated Lego room, and that Lego doesn't mean room. she <laughs> keeps it there. It's just where the most of it is. Oh my god! So we have uh, Lego um, all over the house. That's amazing. Now, now, have you gotten to the point though, where you're just building the house out of Lego? Because it looks like. You're uh, no, no, that I don't think that works really. But there are a lot of houses. She loves building houses, so yeah, there's a few of them uh, behind me, uh -huh. up here, yeah. Yeah. which is uh, her own design, um, and she does uh, lots of exhibitions and has had. She's been on TV and she's had stuff uh, um, shown at Lego. Uh, the headquarters wow. and uh, Legoland and so forth. Is she a master so, builder? I don't know much about Lego, but I know there's like certifications. Yeah, and, no, uh, master builders are very rare animals, okay. uh, okay. and they are very picky and choosy about it. It's it, yeah. those are people that are allowed to buy Lego bricks for uh, in bulk uh, uh -huh. to buy uh, to build stuff. Uh, everyone else needs to get hold of them in a different way. But I think she's uh, fairly, fairly talented. Uh, oh, yes. no, it looks great. I like the, is that a peacock in the background with the wings down or? Yeah, peacock? it's a peacockish thing. Uh, it actually, it moves. Um, and uh, okay. it's a prototype for when she was rehearsing for the, for the Lego Masters show uh, that ran in Denmark. I was going to ask if they had that because they, they had a version of that show running in the US for a while and it was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and she, she joined them in the in the second season and um, was uh, paired up with a with a nice guy who um, and they didn't know each other, so yeah. they had to somehow uh, figure out how does it work when I say this, do you actually do this, mm -hmm. or uh, and who's good at what? Mm -hmm. So they uh, he came he came uh, to our house a couple of times for uh, for the weekend. And uh, I had to be the taskmaster and say, okay, you have 10 hours 
to build something that looks ancient or is an island or something with a ship. So they were restricted in um, in what they could produce. Okay. And that worked uh, really, really surprisingly well. There were um, almost no flukes on on what they did. So um, that's amazing. And that was fun. <laughs> well, yeah, so, no, uh, that's that's really cool. No, mm-hmm. I like I, I love I love I love seeing partners support each other. Like, all right, I guess I'm, I guess I'm the you know doing this. So you, you know, I'll give you some rules, and you guys build Lego. So that's great. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. All right, let's take a look here. Uh, I want to make sure I'm saying your name right because I should have checked before. But we're in pre-show banter. Is it? Do we say it Matthias or Matthias or is it completely Matthias? Like Matthias. All right, Matthias. <laughs> what time is it where you are? Uh, I'm way ahead of uh, John and Klaus because oh. I'm uh, already at sixteen forty uh, <laughs> in an office uh, room, uh, probably about ten meters away. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're, 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 we're really local. Yeah, just down the hall. Yeah, very good. All right, Jeremiah, what time is it where you are? Uh, I'm in Germany, so I'm also in the same time zone. Okay, so very good. Okay. 440. 440. So we got a lot of folks there in Germany. Excellent. And is that Casio, is that correct? Yes, exactly. I'm same time zone as the guys, 440. Yeah, I'm in Poland. And besides Lars, I really love Lego as well, but my Lego, as you can see here, is moving and small baby room Aww. it's kind of my my new lego stuff so everything messy. oh are, do we do we have if you don't <laughs> mind me asking a uh, baby on the way or you're converting a nursery back to no home? she's already nine months uh, already now we are still moving things mm-hmm. and so on so. Mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> i uh i spent the weekend and the reason i asked that is uh uh i spent the weekend making a bunch of baby clothing for yeah. Black Hills, because it's not something we carry in the store, and uh, there's a package coming for you, John, as well. Uh, yeah. But yeah, if it gets there, we we'll make your yeah. 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 Um, But I made a bunch of like baby-sized hoodie. I can just show one. Hold on. Yeah, show it. Hold on. Um, uh, where is it? Step <laughs> off screen here. Sorry. Which one is I'm just checking out all those hats that you got. Yeah. Oh, Red team, blue team. <laughs> All right, there we go. So we've got a couple things here. So we've got our our RECA, you know, onesie. <laughs> so actor there, our RECA onesie. Then we have our uh, our Black Hills information. <laughs> <laughs> turn. Baby turn, yes. And, <laughs> And of course, uh, you know, baby hackers have to have their first hoodie. So definitely their first little hoodie and baby. <laughs> so my wife and I spent a bunch of time this weekend uh, making a couple things for different stuff. And That's so- I had like this table over here is like nothing but baby clothes. And uh, somebody said. Why do you think so many people at Black Hills have had babies at the same time? I'm like, well, about nine months ago was. Uh, yeah. <laughs> let's take a look here, uh, the holidays. So you put two and two together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Mine got she got a gift. Uh, uh, last year was a friend. He was in Defcon, and he mm-hmm. brought a gift, which is this kind of uh, not a hood, but kind of a baby. It's, mm-hmm. She already, of course, grown and don't feed mm-hmm. anymore. But she was mm-hmm. sh- her her first hacker clothing. Like, Aww. <laughs> that's how I. It's funny. That's how I announced my first daughter to the world. Um, I knew before I had gone to Black Hat, and I was over in the like area where you can you know little shop where you can get stuff, and they had a onesie that said Black Hat uh, Future Hacker. Or something like that, and I, I, t- I bought it, of course, and took a picture, and I was like, "Oh, and by the way, uh, this is happening." Um, so, yeah, I totally get that. Cool. <laughs> All right. So, excellent. So, we've got a few more minutes here. We got about fifteen minutes. So, for those of you who are on, welcome. Uh, again, you show up early, so we show up early. There's about twenty-three people in this stream, but that's not everybody because some people are, you know, coming in from different channels and listening, but. For those of you who are here, thanks for coming to hang out as we kind of do pre-show banter and we just get loose and chat a little bit. But what we're going to do at 11 is we're having a chat with these wonderful folks from Europe. You know, we heard if you've been on, you heard Germany and Poland and all, all over the place, right? 
and we want to talk about what's going on with cybersecurity in that region. Uh, obviously, Black Hills is in South Dakota. I'm in Florida, uh, which is its own type of crazy. Uh, but um, I know it's, it's, it's fine to laugh. Uh, so the, uh, it's its own type of crazy. And uh, but we want to know, hey, what you know, what's going on in Europe? What what's different? If what conferences are there? Uh, so we're going to have a lot of fun uh, when we hit eleven o'clock. We're going to chat. Uh, with all these fine folks about what they what they do uh, with conferences there, what kinds of differences there might be, and things that if you're going to go visit that area, I want to learn all about those areas. I'm a little jealous of John getting to be uh, over there and really get immersed in it. So we're going to talk about all that. But if you want to, yeah, I know the Legos are fantastic. Um, so if you want to join us in the chat, we are not in the Black Hills chat today. We are over in Discord. That's discord.gg forward slash anti And we are in the, let's take a look here. We are in the web and live stream channel. I always forget, webcasts and live streams. So you'll find it in there, webcasts and live streams. And we're all in there hanging out and chatting under anti-siphon training. So definitely come hang out with us and check things out. And oh my gosh. I actually didn't see that. I just scrolled up, Ryan. I did not see that Dan had made the Kill It With Fire gift for you. That is beautiful beyond measure. That is from a few days ago, though. I had missed that. That is lovely. It's more It's more frightening. Oh, no. Me. I guess I'll show my face since I'm talking, but yeah. it, I, I'm scared of my own image there. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, when we do webcasts, and many of you listening uh, probably know this, but when we end them, uh, either myself or Jason or someone else says, Ryan, kill it with fire, and he cuts the stream, and someone called out, and they said, we need we need the gif of the little girl, but with Ryan's face, and uh, Dan, who goes by Haircut Fish in Discord, uh, has become kind of our meme master, and we, you almost summon him and be like, Dan, and like a few minutes later, it will appear, so very good. All right. So we're going to talk about a lot of stuff today. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff today. We've got a bunch of topics. Do you want to tease them a little bit, John, while we're in pre-show banter so even the audience can, can maybe think about questions yeah. and whatnot? Yeah, let's, let's, let's do that. Um, let's start off with, uh, I don't know, is there any recent data breaches in Europe that we should talk about, folks? Um, anything well i was just even saying do you want to talk about this the topics that we're going to discuss uh oh, that's interesting. yeah so that folks can think about you know think about uh, the questions and you know maybe ask other questions and discord around them thanks for clarifying okay yeah no worries, no right. worries. yeah we've got a bunch of topics so we're going to talk about europe data breaches <laughs> uh we'll talk about the move it breach or uh you know, move it essentially. Um, AI. Well, you got to talk about AI these days. Um, but we've got some interesting uh, perspectives on AI that looking forward to talking and chatting about uh, very cool stuff. Um, we're going to talk about uh, underwater sea cables and how things move around and risks. We're going to talk about the Ukraine war. Um, we're going to talk about threat actors. Um, who are some of the new players that we're seeing in new groups that we don't like? <laughs> um, we've got some GDPR stuff. We're going to talk about mm, malware as a service. Is that, is that yeah, maybe? Um, we, we've had some fun stuff coming <laughs> coming through. Uh, at least uh, there's always interesting legal <laughs> battles with Meta, sometimes Google as well. Um, so that's kind of fun to talk about as well. Um, we also want to talk about culture, right? Um, you know, Europe and the U.S., cybersecurity companies and jobs, what are, what's the big difference? You know, like, we, what's it like working for a security company in Europe versus working for one in the U.S.? Um, that one is particularly interesting, I think, with the group of people we have on here. A lot of different experiences, so... Um, I think that's about all of the topics. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, no, I mean, this I think there's going to be a lot of really good discussion around that. I wanted the, the folks that are already, you know, tuning in and, and watching on YouTube and whatnot to know, hey, you know, uh, this is what we're going to talk about. So if you've got questions about it, stick around because uh, we're definitely going to talk about those things. And, uh, you know, for the next couple hours, we'll we'll learn more about what's going on in the cybersecurity scene, if you will. I hate to say scene almost, but it really kind of encapsulates everything uh, in Europe, in Central Europe. 
And then uh, as we head towards uh, the kind of middle to end of the stream, uh, we're going to play a game of Backdoors and Breaches with all these fine folks. So uh, if you like watching those live streams of people go through uh, Backdoors and Breaches, stick around. We're, we're going to do a European edition. And um, if you don't know what Backdoors and Breaches is, well, stick around as well. Because uh, we'll explain the game and how to play it and how you can use it. And, uh, and, then, and then run a game and uh, go from there. So I, I think we'll have a good time. So yeah. So this is your 10-minute warning. Uh, if you need to go get coffee, which, by the way, my coffee maker broke. And it is a sad, sad day. I went down to get coffee, and it was how like... You, how you survive here? Sorry. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this opportunity to go get some tea, and uh, you and then I'll be back well well energized and ready to roll. There you go. That's what I should have done. I, I think it might do the same. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. Yeah, please go. This is your 10-minute warning as we, we go through and, and uh, those who want to hang out, keep hanging out. But, um, yeah, so uh, 10 minutes to make sure you get into the Discord and whatnot. But, yeah, no, my coffee maker broke. I went downstairs. This is why – so for those who are now listening from the outside, um, we, uh, we generally do – you know, an audio check, a video check, that kind of stuff. And I messaged Ryan. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to be out 10 minutes. I got to run downstairs. I got to get some coffee. I got to do whatever. And, I, and I'm and i lazy. I use a Keurig, those little pods. I know it's not good coffee. I understand. It's fast, though. So I throw the pod in. I hit the button. And it's like, burr, 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 burr. you know, it just doesn't work. And I literally stared at it. Like, why? Why? Giver of life. Why have you forsaken me? So... Is anyone else in the Discord, anyone else here, ad addicted to their, their caffeine as well? No? Just well, me. I think I definitely am. Yeah. Coffee. What, lots, of, lots of coffee. And, lots of um, coffee. Yeah, and I've had this um, brewer for, I think, for ages, since mm -hmm. 2011 or something like that. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a Philips, and it still works. Mm -hmm. But the other day, I got a free one, a really expensive one on... Mm -hmm. um, on Facebook, uh, and I love fixing stuff. Okay. So simple fix. There's so much stuff being thrown out, and I think that's an um, interesting topic as well. Uh, yeah. Both regarding stuff that has data on it, but is broken, so you can't wipe it, and also um, from an environmental perspective, mm -hmm. um, that's something that maybe costs two dollars can break uh, a, a huge piece of electronics or. Um, washing machine or whatever mm -hmm. um, there's so much waste in my opinion but i love um, getting free stuff and fixing it so the latest one was the coffee machine yeah i'm i'm very much the same uh i i do like to fix things but as i get older uh there seems to be less time to fidget with things i've got several kids and whatnot but i totally get it and i agree that i actually wrote that down as something else potentially to talk about because i'm i'm a big maker my 3d printer and laser cutter and all that stuff are over here to the left in my in my office and um i am always jealous envious if you will of the european union's ability to put companies in their place around things like you're going to use USB-C deal with it um you know that kind of stuff to and i'm i'm very curious to find out what what right to repair that was what we call it in the u.s uh we're terrible with that with laws uh the ability to legally go in and fix and repair things so that's something i definitely like to hear from you is there any sort of right to repair laws or uh, does that does that term even make sense in this context yeah, it's it's coming in 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 EU. I, I don't know the details though, but I saw something. A couple, okay. Oh, yeah. oh so like their restrictions aren't already in place to say you can repair this and the company can't stop you from doing it. No, no, no. But that that, that has always been there, but okay. things are changing so that I think it's I think they they mo, mo, mobile phone makers has to make it possible to change the battery. I think that's one of the things that I've heard about. Yeah, but, yeah that's but, new. Yeah. Four years. Yeah, and and that and that that is, that is an EU level, mm -hmm. but but you know it, it it has it has never been illegal to do whatever you want with your own thing. I love that. I That's absolutely love that. Uh, you're probably familiar, and it leads into the the actually the topic of the Ukraine war. So I don't want to kick off the topics just yet, but right to repair is a, a big thing for me. And uh, John Deere, the tractor company. A uh, bunch of super cool Ukrainian hackers. Uh, they 
they were busting the John John Deere firmware so that they could uh, so they could repair the stuff because they're like, do you have any idea how long it takes to get a part if you software disabled it? Like, no, I need to work. So they did it. Now farmers in like Iowa and Idaho and states in the United States are often running Ukrainian hacker firmware on their million dollar combines. It's ridiculous. Um, uh, that's authors. really funny that you bring that up. I was yep. their uh, World Privacy Day keynote speaker like a year or two ago. And John Deere? And, yeah, yeah. And uh, when I was talking with their like CTO, I was asking yeah. him about that. And it was, he's an awesome guy, but that was the topic that, that seemed to make everyone uncomfortable. <laughs> Is the security I left, person going to bring this up? Oh, that's just yeah, yeah, yeah. I was asking him about it. And of course, um, I'll go into detail a little bit later, but I lived in Ukraine for 12 years. Did you really? And, oh, yeah, you've yeah, been yeah. on a webcast before. We've spoken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right after, right after. And, and what's mm -hmm. funny is I was in Krakow then, which yeah. uh, stayed in Poland for a while. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but it, it was funny to bring that up to him, having some, you know, some insider Ukraine knowledge. It was everybody was nervous of where I was going to go with it, or if I was going to bring that up during the keynote, and I left it alone. But you know, and that, that's a huge problem. Tesla in the United States, you see a lot of Teslas in Eastern Europe and countries outside of the European Economic Zone, where same thing. It's required that only a authorized dealership can repair it. And the costs are astronomical. And so people will buy one that's been crashed and take it and just fix it. And, you know, you can get one for thousands and thousands of dollars cheaper mm -hmm. that way. Yeah. There was a guy in Texas who was basically making a business out of that, buying mm -hmm. total Teslas and and going in and hacking them back together. And uh, there was, I think there was some lawsuits involved. They kept doing it. So. Yeah. I know I know a number of people I won't I won't name their names but I know several people who very proudly have framed in their office their cease and desist letter uh, from John Deere <laughs> from you know publishing hacks on how to make the tractor work and they're like yeah that's my cease and desist letter from John Deere I'm like that's awesome <laughs> well if you think about it look at the way that all of these applications and everything you know back in the old days we'd buy software pay mm -hmm. one price for it and now this monthly subscription model, you know, it's, yeah, you need it for ongoing like research and development and everything, but it's such a pain in the ass to the consumer. And if you're a guy that's growing sunflowers or wheat or marijuana or whatever it is you're growing, you don't want to, yeah, you don't, you don't want to, you know, have to pay to change your own oil or, you know, you've put too many hours in this month. You gotta, you gotta take it to the dealership. Yeah. Um, so it's a pain in the ass. It is. No, and, and uh, well, I'll save my next comment for when we actually, you know, kind of get into that area in the webcast because, uh, you know, when you talk, farmers are some of my favorite people because they're the original hackers. They can't wait. They're like, I, you know, I got, I got to fix this in the field. Of my, you know, tomorrow if a storm comes, my crop is done. So your, you know, wait for somebody to come isn't happening. So they'll hack a solution together whatever it may be and, and go with it so uh this is your three minute warning so panelists and and guests uh and also folks watching this is uh your three minute warning i guess i should do two minute warning kind of match up with with sports but i'm sure there's a sport that has a three minute warning and if it isn't uh we'll make it and we'll put it on the ocho um so Three minute warning, two minute warning now. Uh, go uh, use the facilities, walk the dog, pet the cat, whatever it is. Uh, add a euphemism for whatever it is you need to do, but you've got about two minutes until we officially start the webcast. You've still got time to join us over at uh, discord.gg. I really have to think about that. If Ryan could probably get a series of clips for whatever reason, I can't make discord.gg happen in my head and like my brain stops. Uh, but anyway, discord.gg slash anti-siphon. It's up on the screen there in case my brain does stop. Uh, again, see previous reference to lack of copy. Uh, so anti-siphon, A-N-T-I-S-Y-P-H-O-N dot com. Join us over there. And what this two-minute warning is we're warming up here. If you're in the Discord, since it truly is a global broadcast today, a global stream, uh, drop a GIF in. Tell us where you're from without telling us where you're from. And I'm hoping that we get some interesting... Uh, European gifts that will definitely not... Oh, yes, excellent. Oh, man, look at... I don't know what's more impressive, Lars. Um, 
the wall <laughs> in the background or the kitty? Um, there, it's. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Did I wake you? I'm very sorry. I didn't mean to. <laughs> Everyone, shh. The kitty is sleeping. Quiet. He can hear you, Ian. <laughs> I know. It's, it probably appreciates it. Here's the moving. Cat. What kind of cat is it? Lars, what kind of cat is that? Or is it? It's just a cat. Uh, okay. it's, it's a Norwegian forest cat. I'm pretty is sure. It really? Yeah, I think so. It, oh. it, it, it's pretty common in Denmark. Okay, it's beautiful. Very beautiful. Um, I'm back. I guess you're you. discussing my cat. We are. Yes. Yeah. We were. We were asking what kind of cat it was. Oh, he's a Nobu, no, Norwegian forest cat. Okay. And he's okay. about a year old, and he's. Um, well, I've had many, many cats in my life, mm. but he's one of the very, very best. He's so he likes to cuddle oh. and uh, yeah, what he's just a su sweet. And today he's uh, other than a fly that had to die, he's been yeah. sleeping all day. Well, so. such a brave hunter needs a nap, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And oh, what a, yeah. what a nice way to start a webcast with a nice like uh, zoom in on a kitty. So, welcome. It is. 11 o'clock and if you're tuning in we have a treat for you today if you don't recognize the sound of my voice or this bald head i'm ian meyer i'm going to be one of your hosts today for a european webcast where we have put together and i shouldn't even say we i'm going to bring in john bevers here in a moment uh who really helped organize this and wanted to bring a bunch of voices uh, that often maybe aren't heard in the U.S. and really learn more about what's going on in Europe and Central Europe regarding information security, the cybersecurity scene, conferences, and, and differences, challenges that they face that we don't face maybe in the U.S. and uh, challenges we face in the U.S. We were talking in pre-show banter about uh, right to repair is a huge problem here in the U.S. and Europe. It's, it's frankly not. It's just always been available, and they actually fight when a company... The government fights to, to make sure when a company tries to make it difficult to repair a product. So we've got a great webcast today. We're going to talk to these folks. Uh, we're going to find out what's going on in Central Europe. We're going to talk about you know cybersecurity issues in Europe. And then, uh, then we're going to play a game of Backdoors and Breaches. So again, if you're tuning in and you're one of our you know diehards, if you will, and you're into what we do at Back, uh, Black Hills, you probably already know about Backdoors and Breaches. But if you don't, stick around because with this fine group of folks, we're going to play a game of Backdoors and Breaches live and just have some fun with it. So you'll learn about how the game is played. We'll have some fun playing a live game and then uh, we'll wrap up and just kind of wrap up some final thoughts. So hang out with us for the next couple hours. We're, it's, I don't know, it's almost more of a hangout webcast wouldn't you say john mr bevers yeah absolutely yeah so john why don't you uh so we got john bevers here our our man in poland uh part of our bhis team you've probably heard or seen his voice uh when we do streams john why don't you introduce yourself and uh the team here that's gonna gonna be chatting for the next couple hours sure thanks hey i'm john uh aka the traveler um i have been working with black hills infosec for a while now um, and uh, also with a couple of the other um, various family companies that we have, uh, anti-siphon training, Wild West Hacking Fest and things like that. Um, I recently, in the middle of uh, one of the many digital nomad treks that I had, um, wound up uh, getting married and moving to Europe. And now I live in Poland. And um, it, being out here, uh, I don't know many people. <laughs> So um, I'm going to conferences and I'm talking to people and meeting people. Um, and uh, one of the first people I talked to out here was Klaus. So, yeah. Hey, you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. I'm a um, co-op guy, B-Sides Copenhagen. And it was around our first uh, B-Sides in, in 2019. I met um, Black Hills around the time where, you, where they introduced um, Big doors and bridges on the webcast, and they in the end of the webcast they were they were asking for a company or for conferences that were that wanted free big doors and bridges games, and that was like three months away from our or for conferences. I was like, yeah, I know one of those, and that's basically when I, from from that when that that is when the Black Hills became our friends, and and, so, and since then Jason has been a lot of help uh, for everyone, and now uh, and now John as well. So yeah, yeah and and, uh, and apart from that, we we are here as a pre party thing or whatever you want to call it for b size Uma, which is um, tomorrow and i'll be speaking about living with adhd and that's the talk i've been doing at some around uh, around europe for some conference now i'll also be going to, to wild west hacking fest 
Oh, you're going to come out? Oh, excellent. We'll get to see you. Oh, that's great. Yeah, well, well, I'm, I'm hoping to do that. I'm, 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 a little, I'm a little short on cash. So, so I, I put together a GoFundMe campaign. I'm, I'm sure Ryan will be showing the, the QR code to that so it can sponsor me. Because yeah. That would be really, really great. Yeah, there it is. The, th the thing is, I'm talking about HHC. First of all, I have HHC. I, I was diagnosed like three years ago. Mm -hmm. And I've been security for 20 years, and I think um, it's something that that people should talk more openly about. I think it's a very common thing, both in IT and infosec in particular. And um, uh, people, employers, both employees and employers, should pay more attention to it. And and um, yeah, great. And and and, and I, I want to break down taboos and uh, basically uh, to teach people about what HJD is and and especially what it isn't. It's not just you know hyperactive, annoying kids. It's also, you know, people, normal people that, or rather people that seem normal, but just can't can concentrate because, you know, things are in their head all the time. And that's, that's the thing, that's the case for me. I, I love that you talk about that openly. Uh, I also, I want to make sure I've got this right here. This is the website for the for the conference, right? looks like it's in uh, November. Is that right? Uh, yeah, so yeah, that's, it's November 11th. And okay. I, and I also I also have a have a sticker here maybe in, oh those yeah those are great yeah exactly. those are awesome yeah, I, yeah we, it, it was around around the time of our first con our first conference we I asked on the global B sites um, mm -hmm. mailing list if, if somebody wanted to help us design a logo because we were really shit at doing that <laughs> and then uh, then a woman called Ray uh, Ray Wondersmith turned uh, mm -hmm. she showed up she um, got back to me and. Um, she since then she's been very big in OSN, especially in maritime OSN. She's she's been writing books about it even. Oh, very and cool. uh, she she coincidentally she had, she had just been to Copenhagen and we were discussing themes on it and we she had a couple of things going up uh, as as we had a lot, we had a couple of themes coming up as we were discussing and it turns out that you know obviously Viking ships are are big. It's a it's a Danish mm. European or Northern European. Long thing, time, but, but but we we had a couple of signs and 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 we um, had had somebody we had a vote on Twitter on Twitter and uh, and I think twenty people voted and the majority wanted the Viking ship even though as a Dane we're kind of fed up with it but you know <laughs> in that yeah in that the thing like when you live there you're like yeah it's like I I'm I'm in Orlando Florida right and uh, I know exactly the the global mailing list you're talking about because for about five years I was the president for B sides Orlando. <laughs> And just recently handed it off to the lovely and wonderful, amazingly talented Tabitha Di Domenico. And so I'm still involved, but I know what goes into planning all that. And everyone's like, oh, Orlando, Disney, right? And I was like, well, that's technically Kissimmee, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, Disney. Yeah, we've got. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and, you know, and also, you can't use any Disney things on the, on right. the, on the sphere or you'll be you know, sued to hell. You absolutely will. Like, I, I, I still remember when I was young. And uh, there was a daycare and they painted some Disney characters on like the side of the building, right? For the kids, it's not like kids, it's just like Mickey Mouse, whatever. And I get it. It's IP law. I get it. It's your trademark. I get it. Fine. Whatever. Um, but they sued this little daycare in Orlando and it was the most wonderful PR coup de gras uh, for Universal Studios. Universal mm -hmm. had just opened in Orlando and they said, wow, that's horrible what Disney's doing. Feel free to use any of our characters. And so they painted, like, Scooby-Doo and Hanna-Barbera stuff all over it. And I was like, oh, somebody's a PR genius over there. <laughs> like that makes yeah, yeah, yeah. So, talking about that, some, somebody made a Winnie the Pooh uh, horror movie because the, the design of the IP of the original Winnie the Pooh before Disney uh, yeah. just it became open. So, yeah. Oh, that, that's was, uh, that was a good way to celebrate that. And as, celebrate uh, that. as James says, Mickey will be open soon too. Well, there 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 are a lot, of, a lot of iteration. Maybe the old the old old one. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So um, that's awesome. No, I, I I love the dance that's going on there with because the, I think what the thing is with the Winnie the Pooh is you can't put him in the red shirt. <laughs> no, no, no. In seconds, Disney came up with the shirt. Apparently. Yeah. But so, without the but naked, he's uh, he's yeah. all right. If you got a naked bear, you're good to go. Yeah, yeah, with honey. So that's great. So no, we'll we'll talk more about besides Copenhagen and and whatnot. I uh, love that we we put some links in the chat. So if you're in that part of the world and you definitely want to check that out, in November. Hopefully, we'll get to see you at Wild West Hackenfest. Fest. Love to see you come out to South Dakota. It's it's a super fun time. Uh, yeah, so let's let's uh, let's go around it. Yeah, no, um, I that that. 
that's ama- oh, that's the other thing I wanted to mention. Yeah, so you are amongst friends uh, when you come to talking about ADHD. I was late diagnosed as well. Actually, it was only a couple years ago, and I got on Vivance. And by the way, not a mental health he's, professional. He's, 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 you know all that. Too, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, so this is my personal experience. Don't take it as medical advice. I'm not an investor. Uh, whatever. You know, take all the legal disclaimers. But I got on Vivance, and it was incredible. Uh, I like. I was like, is this how people think? <laughs> like, you know, and, and you realize it's a superpower and also mm. this curse. You can get hyper-focused on things and people go, how do you get so much done? And you're like, oh, because I'm enabled to turn it off. That's why. Uh, and yeah. then they, they so, don't do well, it. My, you're yeah, my, my, yeah. My, my, my problem is that, that, my, that my brain won't focus at all, not even hyper-focused, so I don't even have that advantage, unfortunately. Oh, but, but, I'm very, but I'm very good at getting very stupid ideas. That's, oh, uh, yeah. No, yeah. When your brain will go everywhere, you come back with very interesting oh, ideas. So speaking of going over, why don't we uh, go over to Sam over here on the other side of the screen. John, uh, let's go back to let's go back to our rounds of introductions. Why don't you introduce uh, the next person? Actually, I'm going to pass this to Klaus to introduce. Um, yeah, sure. Oh, it, nice. Klaus and I both have invited people to this. So we'll oh, wonderful. Yeah. Why don't you guys just go back and forth and pull them in? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Sam. Uh, I met Sam. Shit, how, how, where, where did I meet you? I can't remember. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I've never oh, met you. Oh, yeah. maybe, maybe it was Beside Lana last year, but and, and, it, and it turns out that she's uh, that she's organized and like what looks like half of the B sides in the in the UK. Wow. Newcastle, Leeds, Lancashire, and that's cool. And she's also doing do it. She, she also have, have, have has a real life job at at Exabeam, and that's cool. She is a uh, uh, yeah we. I, 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 I remember that last year at at, at Macon St. Haggers, the the attending event in in Holland, we were there, and that was cool. Yeah, but uh, well, maybe, maybe maybe you want to say more about yourself, Sam? What did I, I get? Just think it? Right, it was B side Dublin, I believe. I think it was in the bar after B side Dublin that we met. Does that, that sound me? extremely reasonable? Yeah. It's especially the bar yeah. part, but that, but I, but I guess that could go for every B side on the British Isles. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, okay, I can speak from experience. That's just any B sides, period. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, in, in, in the British Isles, it's it's more. I mean, people just go to the bar, and in, 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 <laughs> that, 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 that that happened with B sides London. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, for a couple of people, they they only made it to the bar. Sam, where where are you in in the British Isles? I always yeah. have to be careful. And I just want to say in that part of the world, because I was on the phone with uh, an ISACA group in Dublin, but they were in the part of Dublin that very much does not identify as the UK. And I'm like, well, you're in the UK. And there was silence. <laughs> and not in the UK at all. No, it's it's funny. You get, I, I sit with um, Americans fairly, fairly frequently. And I kind of have to draw out the like these are the British Isles. Mm-hmm. Um, this is Britain. This is mm-hmm. Ireland. This is Northern Ireland. Scotland, Wales, um, mm-hmm. England. That's the UK. Um, so yeah, it is complicated. Like most things here, we really like to just you know add complexity to a situation. Oh, yeah, very long I mean, history. So <laughs> that that helps. Uh, yeah. yeah, history of not great things, some great things, and terrible yeah. things. Um, but they teach you here that they're great things, and that's important. Um, so uh, I'm in Buckinghamshire, which I'm, it's the home counties, darling, which sounds very posh. Um, I'm about one hour from London, northwest. Okay. There you go. That's where I am in the world right now. And often I'm not in my house, so this is quite um, novel. But I'm in this building with my things. I'm also in a building with a lot of stuff that's just come back from InfoSec Europe, which oh, all got sent to my house. Um, I'm going to send to a warehouse in Peterborough because I don't want it in my house. In fact, if you could see the amount of boxes in here um, that could collapse on me at any minute, we might see live death during this session. <laughs> we're going uh, to have, we're gonna have like uh, something on live leak pretty shortly, right? Right, exactly. Do you have John there? Oh, I don't know. I will, I will get John. John, is, John will be on. Okay, I know cool, where he cool. is. Cool. If everybody, if everybody wants to see John, if, even even though that they don't really know like it, they want to see John. <laughs> okay. That's why he invited me. I've got some taxidermy, but that's not as exciting as John. Um, I'll leave taxidermy? what John is. Taxidermy? taxidermy. Which John are we talking about? Uh, yeah, we can't, you can't just zoom past that. Taxidermy. Right. Uh, up there, there is a, a duck, which is called Captain Jack. Sorry, Captain, Captain Quack Sparrow. Oh. Okay. Uh, 
Captain, Brian Edith, did you say person. Captain Quack Sparrow? Yeah. That's beautiful. <laughs> I love everything about that. Yeah, uh, it's Tina Dancer, who was the pole cat. If you look down there, underneath there somewhere, there is a badger. And it's Lisa since. Well, it's a badger. It was a badger once. So. Oh, my gosh. The badger's so, called Daniela Westbrook. I've got to say. I've got to say something for the audience, right? All the people on here are involved in conferences and whatnot, many of them them B-sides. What Sam is describing is such a constant for especially volunteer conference organizers. Your home becomes this quasi-para warehouse. And I remember the first time I ran B-sides Orlando, um, a couple vendors shipped all their stuff to my house and my front room was literally like just piled up with boxes of, you know, pamphlets and paper and this and that and the other. And my wife, my, 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 my long suffering wife looked at me and said, I love you. Um, I know this is important to you. This never happens again. You're getting a storage facility. <laughs> so yeah, friend. And that was where the B side Orlando storage facility was born. Uh, so. But yeah, no, that's yeah. excellent. Very good. Um, so you were involved in a lot of B-sides. Which, which B-sides? Right, so um, Newcastle was my first one I got involved with, and there is a short story there I will hold. Um, Leeds, we've literally just done Leeds this weekend. And Leeds I was helping as an advisor to begin with and then just couldn't leave. So there we are. Oh, and it was fantastic. fantastic. So if you're at B-sides Leeds, um, know that I love you because it was amazing. Um, and also B-sides Lancashire. None of these things are anywhere near my house. Um, the closest one is probably a two and a half hour drive. And there are much closer B-sides to my house because UK seems to be going crazy for B-sides right now. Right. B-sides Exeter popped up this morning, which is amazing. But Newcastle, um, one of my other jobs is, and stay with me, I do have marketing in my job title. Okay. Uh, and I keep saying I'm an accidental marketer, but I've been doing it for seven years now, so maybe... Um, <laughs> Maybe I'm a marketer now. But I used to do incident response and other technical things. So I do have opinions on stuff that may be outdated, but who knows. Um, I contacted B-Sides Newcastle for a sponsor brochure. And I got myself a conference because it was one guy, my dear friend Ben, who decided to try and organize B-Sides in 12 weeks um, in a skate park. Okay. And what, this did they was lose a bet? Nine... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. With himself, I imagine. Um yeah, if you've met Ben, who is Pyro Guy on Twitter, then maybe you should all know that's true. He also does um, Infosec Battlebots, which is very cool. Oh, but yes! I... <laughs> no, no, I know, know exactly Ben's what you're story. talking about, because my Antweight yeah. bot is right down there. Um... Love it. Anyway, um, I'm so sorry, ben I interrupted you. Was... I just got excited. Because yeah, no worries. Of... Battlebots. It's all cool. Yeah. Uh, so Ben was nine weeks from the conference at that point mm. and had, did not have a sponsor brochure. And at that point, I was like, do you need some help? <laughs> because mm. I can help. And there we are. That was five years ago. We're, we're doing our uh, B-Size Newcastle 5. It's coming up in September. Nice. Nice. Uh, we got a question from Fat Man Will, regular ca uh, regular caller to the show here. But I think it's pretty clear. Is there a good job market in England for cybersecurity? Yes. Yeah, there is. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of companies here. Um, ranging in sizes, there's a lot of vendors here. If you want to go to Vendorland, which is where I've lived for the past 20 years, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. oh, well, um, yeah, they, it is. There's a great job market here for cybersecurity. We are, I, I think, if you look at us, and maybe I'm jumping ahead on questions, no, if you look at us maturity wise compared to the states, I'd say we are we generalize a little bit behind, not much, mm -hmm. maybe a year or two, but um, yeah, really good job market. The, some of the challenges you'll hit are, without being political, related to our decisions that we've made recently. Mm. Um, but, but that said, I think there are there are ways of, of, of coming into the country with sponsorship and visas and, and the like. Um, mm. And do you I like was going to ask that question: yeah. is, is it is it a good market for people who are in that region, or if they're people that are looking to relocate to say, I really want kind of kind of what happened with with John? He went went overseas, found he liked it, found he liked a person, found they had a baby, found they you know whatever, and uh, you know life changes, and you say, wow, can I bring my skill? Is it is it a good market for folks that want to come from other countries, or are there challenges there? 
we made it harder with Brexit, especially if you're in Europe right now. We have this lovely ability to, to work, live, study in anywhere in the EU. And now we've, we've decided we didn't want to do that anymore mm. for whatever reason. Not all of us, but some people did. So that's what's happened. Um, so that has made things a little tougher to get jobs here. That said, if you got if you got to skills, um, that's always appreciated. So, so yeah, it, it is very possible to, to get here um, and, and have a job and work here and enjoy the rain. I have I've said on several occasions, I, I was married in Scotland. My wife and I got married in Scotland. Uh, for and since we're on international, uh, just just I think north of Inverness in Bewley at this beautiful little chapel on an estate. It was just her and I and the wedding planner and whatnot. And I could go on and on about that, but I, I loved it immensely. If I were ever to move overseas, it would probably be Scotland. And we've we've looked at it a couple times to be like, well, you know, you do cybersecurity, and before I did this, which I I, I very much feel you, Sam, because uh, my role at Black Hills could be considered marketing and internally we, we sometimes call it marketing but we're content and community but before that i spent just like you 20 years um in enterprise it and security so fortune 500 companies leading you know penetration testing teams vulnerability teams you know all that stuff so often i'll run webcasts or tabletop exercises and i'll literally say i know i look like i'm a muppet and i really am um, but I've got about 20 years of experience doing what you did in your seat. And I'm like, oh, okay, very good. So I totally understand exactly where you're coming from. You're like, oh, you're the marketing person. And I'm like, I can configure your IPS IDS if you need me to. <laughs> um, so totally get it. So that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, it is funny when people go, oh, the marketing's. And I'm like, well, I'll try and help. And then, yeah. and then they're everything. like, wait a minute, hold on. What's what but, happening? You know, yeah. I, I, can, I can hold my own, I feel yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, well, yeah, if you can juggle as many conferences as you're juggling, I mean, what's a what's an IPS IDS at that point? You just read the manual. Uh, so anyway, um, so wonderful. Thank you for being here. Before we go on to the next introduction, I do want to mention something. I should have done it beforehand. I'm so ingrained, and I think all of us are so ingrained in the idea and culture of B-sides that we often forget to explain, what the heck is B-sides? Why do they keep mentioning B-sides? So if you don't know what B-sides are... Long, long, long time ago on the way back, uh, you know, there really were only two major conferences specifically in the U.S. that, you know, security professionals, hackers, folks that wanted to talk about information security, cybersecurity, breaking stuff, could do talks and go to, and it was Black Hat and DEF CON, right? And uh, if your paper or your talk got rejected, there was a bunch of really good talks and a few folks uh, sat down and said, why don't we, like the B-side of a record, like an old album, these are great tracks, you know, but they're on the B-side. So why don't we create a conference called B-Sides and you come give your talk here? And it originally started as this community-driven idea of let's not leave this knowledge on the cutting room floor. Let's share it. And what it grew into was a global distributed effort there is no well there's there's some b-sides global at this point just a little bit but that's mostly to protect the brand um but every b-sides that's set up you, anybody can set up a b-sides and you run it as a community event it's all volunteer driven so if you go to a b-sides and you're like i can't believe they didn't do this realize that these are people giving their blood sweat and tears to try and help better information security and that's the reason you see so many of them, and some of them very small, and some of them very large. Like our B-sides in um, Orlando uh, generally gets between 500 and 1,000 people. Now, those numbers are a little weird because of the pandemic, so we don't know. Uh, but either way, it's, and some are very small. Some get as few as like 20, 30, 50 people. And it's about growing your local community and and building that community and giving them a place to share knowledge so thank you to all of you thank you sam and, and if you've never heard of it find a b-sides in your area and if you're somewhere in the world that doesn't have one think about starting one you know so yeah thank you J john let's go back to john and klaus who, who are we going to introduce next um, how about talking about b-sides how about our our B-Sides folks here. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, it's, well, we are, we are B-Sides Zuma, which is happening tomorrow. And uh, we have to have to organize of, of that as well. Matthias here. Yeah. Hi. So I'm Matthias. I, I uh, 
um, uh, the uh, community part of InfoSec community. Uh, next to me is not Leif Nixon, but he will be the security part, uh, I hope, when he lands. So uh, I... Yeah, 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 yeah. Life, life, life is doing the keynote tomorrow, right? Yep. Talk, talking about how to hack, how to hack countries, I guess. Yes, how to hack a country. A practical guide, he has promised. Ah, cool. Look, looking forward to that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, anyway, I uh, decided on a whim, uh, and I shout out to uh, Hacks for Pancakes for uh, prodding me with this idea. Uh, start a B site because uh, there was none in Sweden, and uh, the closest one was in Oslo or Copenhagen. So uh, this is the first year we're doing it uh, tomorrow. Uh, we have 40 participants, cool. uh, unless someone registers right now, uh, which uh, will be a, a slightly shaky uh, in regards of catering. But uh, hopefully, we'll have a, a nice and not horribly stressful event tomorrow. Uh, yeah, but, but, but we're sure that, that I mean, if 60, if 60 people sign up now, and there's a hundred tomorrow. We'll 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 get we'll 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 think of something with the food, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've already ordered forty lunches, but uh, I'm yeah, sure we'll, that uh, we'll share. something we'll share. can happen. No problem. We'll share. I, I love this conversation, by the way, because this is what conference organizers deal with all the time. Where it's like, exactly. how do we deal with how to? Uh, okay. So no, yeah. and this is but great. at least they get a relaxing evening now instead of stressing about uh, all the things that aren't fixed exactly. yet. Yeah, no, don't don't. Uh, I had a boss once say, "Don't borrow trouble." You know, don't worry about it now. When it's a problem, well, you deal with it. words, it's easy, much easier said than done. Much easier said than done. Yeah. Matthias, okay. is B sides Umi the farthest north B sides of 2023? Uh, I would be surprised this, if there was anyone any B-sides that has ever been further north? Uh, well, there, there used to be one in Reykjavik week as, so, as far as I know, but it's inactive, and I don't think there's anything more north. Well, I, I think Reykjavik is a smidge south of here, but I would oh. have to... Oh, well, 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 well or, the next, the, the, we do probably have one on Svalbard as well, Bisa Svalbard. I will, I will put that. <laughs> That would be hard to get to. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. Don't don't worry about the lunches we're hearing here. Ninety nine point nine percent. There's there's no through crust, so you're doing just fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I love. It. So who's with me? We're gonna go start B sides Arctic Circle, and just plant the flag on, uh, you know, deep cold weather research. Yeah, B, B, uh, B sides Arctic, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, Actually, let me correct myself. Uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, Reykjavik is north by uh, 0.3 degrees. <laughs> Close. Details. I love the specificity. Like, you just had to check. You're like, no. Yeah, I just checked now. Uh, 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 but yeah, uh, no, if, if that's a requirement, I can speak with some people in Kirana and we can see if we can get something <laughs> above the Arctic Circle. <laughs> Maybe Trump, so. Yeah, it's accepted, right? Yeah. Who did you say was the, the keynote again? Uh, I thought Leif uh, Nixon. Yeah, what are they going to be talking about? How to hack a country, a practical guide. How to hack a country, a practical That sounds fascinating. And life would be joining us here tonight, but I think he's stuck in Alanda, yeah. He's he, stuck in Stockholm, unfortunately. He should, yeah. He was supposed to land two hours ago, uh, but if but I'm didn't. correct, he. Yeah, well, yeah. He, I, I, I spoke with him yeah. before we went yeah. live, and he he went, he, he would go straight to to his hotel and then see if he could make some of it virtually. Okay. We'll see. Yeah. If it makes it, well, nice. hopefully they can make it. If not, I hope I uh, wish them safe travels. So now this is, so, uh, yeah, this is excellent. No, um, good luck on your B sides. Uh, I know it is a, a stressful moment, but always worth it. And I'm sure the the folks that are there. And this is like I was saying, if you go to a B side, sometimes it's 40 folks, but I, I kind of like that. You go to a B sides and it's for, and you can literally meet everyone. 
You, mm -hmm. It's not even hard. You can just go through and get to know everyone and network and share ideas and whatnot. And that's really what besides the global community has become is a place to interact, to share knowledge, to, you know, find people, you know, in your, not only locally, but um, as Klaus had mentioned, you know, went to the B-Sides global list, which goes everywhere, which is a mailing list for the organizers and said, we need a sticker. And poof, someone popped out of the woodwork and said, yeah, I can help you with a sticker. No problem. What do you need? So it's, yeah, it's a really cool environment. In, 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 my, in my previous jobs, I, job I went to a lot of lot of B sides, both in Europe and and also to B side Las Vegas. And B sides Umi is, is is the smallest one I've ever been to, so that's cool. Excellent. Mm -hmm. All right, so where are we going next? Who who are we going to hear from? And in... one, one of yours? Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, let's introduce Jeremiah. Um, I met Jeremiah many, many, many years Months ago, ago. <laughs> um, when we worked on a movie project together back in the what was it the Late '90s, early 2000s, somewhere around there. Well, you got to say what uh, movie it was now. You can't just. I, it was a just. A, well, I'll let Jeremiah talk about it. But okay. um, <laughs> uh, I, I recently, um, just a few years ago, reconnected with Jeremiah when I was visiting Ukraine, and uh, found out he was work, had been working in the security industry for many years. So that was a, a cool thing that our career paths kind of crossed again. Um, so I thought he would be a great guest for the show tonight. So I'll let Jeremiah speak with. Uh, about himself and what he's doing. Thanks for uh, having me, guys. Really nice to be here. So my name is Jeremiah Fowler. I'm a cybersecurity researcher. Uh, in a previous lifetime, John and I, you know, had a creative project where where we, uh, me and another guy, pretended to be Amish. I, I grew a beard for three or four months, and and basically we did all the ridiculous stuff that the Amish wouldn't do, including. I remember we we had a friend that had an empty bar that was under construction, and I've always wanted to be thrown down a bar. It was awesome. So <laughs> dreams really do come true. Uh, I, I found those tapes, by the way, John, not long ago. Yeah. Story, so yeah, we're yeah, going so to need those for. <laughs> yeah. We're going to need those. So so that was really fun, and you know I lived in Ukraine for twelve years. I lived in Kiev. I worked for a big software company there. Then. They started hiring, you know, people from Silicon Valley and that company had a data breach. It was like 13 million customers, you know, nothing. And um, even though the data was encrypted, they used an older algorithm, security community whipped our ass. Uh, and the owners of that company basically gave me a, a free budget to say, all right, we want to figure out how data breaches happen. And, you know, their idea was to create a product from it. But the way we looked at it is we were finding real data and helping real people. And once they brought in some of these, you know, more corporate types, they were like, what's the ROI, the ROI of your department? I'm like, we're helping people. And uh, and then they closed this down. <laughs> so and that's yeah. And that's you know, I, I branched out on my own and uh, created security discovery with a partner of mine. And um, he's Ukrainian. He's currently working primarily with the uh, Ukrainian IT army, uh, as well as a, a couple of other close associates. So I, I'm always bouncing ideas around with them or, you know, hearing what the latest projects are. Uh, unlike the American see something, say something in the Ukrainian IT army, it's see nothing, say nothing. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone keeps like hush, hush. But so there's a lot of counter... Uh, cybersecurity efforts that are going on where, you know, looking for open webcams that might identify uh, air defense, mm -hmm. looking for vulnerable servers, looking for, you know, basically anything that Russia could exploit. Uh, the cybersecurity community in Ukraine is, is trying to find it first and, mm -hmm. and secure it. And then, of course, offensive operations against Russian. Uh, there was a case a while back where they got got into some emails, you know, tricked people into sending pictures. They found a ton of crypto wallets that belonged right. to, yeah. And, and then they emptied them and sent them to Ukraine. <laughs> so it's like hacking with the calls. Oh, uh, I, I, so, you know, I never want to be like, go forth and commit crimes, but you know, sometimes you're just like, mm, that's probably okay. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah you're like, I see nothing, say nothing. Right. But, oh, yeah, there so, you go. There, there you go. Yeah. So I'm I'm the guy as a cyber security researcher. I've done this, you know, probably close to a decade now. I've I've found some massive data breaches. Uh, found Fox Broadcasting a couple years ago. Found Estee Lauder, um, CBS Health. You know, some really massive data breaches. So, you know, I, I'm that person that a CTO never wants to get an email from. And uh, but you would be surprised at how many major companies, uh, once they've had a data breach you know, just put their head in the sand, pretend it didn't happen. And I always make the joke that it's all fun and games until the BBC calls you for a comment. Right. That's right. Which has happened. It's happened many times. They've called you. They, they have your number to call for a comment uh, or. Um, well, I publish my contacts like okay. everywhere, you know, just in case. Uh, but no, you know, if they're contacting a, a company or an organization mm -hmm. or, or even a government entity uh, to ask for a comment, you know, on a report or, or something that I've published, then, you know, of course they want to hear both sides. And, right. you know, we, we found a child tracking app. Uh, this has been years ago. And the owner of that app actually told a BBC journalist that we had hacked them and we used their PayPal account to buy domain names. And like, you know, just this unreal fantasy that they had created of all these things we had done. And then, mm -hmm. you know, when it turned out to be false, the, the, the guy went, went silent, but so, you know, responsible disclosure and with data incidents is something that's really important, you know, having a communication channel of how to properly report it, you know, other than just farming out your entire security apparatus to one of these bug bounty uh, websites, or platforms, you know, it's, it's really important that companies have that. And I see such a small amount that actually do. So that's what I do. I'm a, I'm a data hunter. Uh, recently, I've uncovered some, some pretty interesting things. I found a crypto scam network and got about half of their website shut down and taken offline. So that was, it was fun. Let me ask you a question because I want to. There's two things I want to bring up here. One, one, Ryan's got something queued up for the screen here that I think everyone will uh, find interesting. But do you ever worry about that? Like, do you worry about your personal safety and getting? And I, I hate to even say that because if you haven't, it's like, no, oh, I guess I haven't. But you know, you you take down a bunch of scammer networks, especially when some of these are associated with criminal organizations that are not very forgiving. Uh, you know, well, what, what do you do about that? <laughs> I'm pretty radical. I've I've been to around 40 countries. I've I've been places I shouldn't. Uh, I spent time with John in Baltimore, which oh, you know, I'm, I. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm I don't know. I I just have this mindset of you know I'll go when I go, but um, some some sort of invincibility there. Right. Uh, with these, so these Nigerian uh, crypto scammers. Mm -hmm. I got a tip from that from a friend who, of course, got. What they were doing was they were hacking social media accounts and then messaging everybody like, oh, my God, look, you know, mm -hmm. at this return I made, I invested 500. And this person, well, the acquaintance lost like mm -hmm. five grand. And I'm like, who does this? You know, and, and, and they sent me the link and asked me if I could, you know, just see if they're a legitimate company. And then I found footprints in their source code mm -hmm. and I was able to, you know, collect about 300 of their websites and what i did i sent them emails and i spoofed the link to an ip tracker and so <laughs> i just cross-referenced all of their ip addresses and the the link tracker or the ip tracker also gave me their device information so i put together they had about 30 people working on it and i i gave that to the nigerian like special cyber crimes unit hmm. and they actually will take action on them because they get to confiscate their equipment, wow. uh, you know, any money they have, their their property. So I, I definitely ruined some days, but at the same time, I hope that I help some some very ignorant crypto investors uh, from from falling for those scams. Yeah. So no, I mean, I, I'm not really scared in in that respect. You know, criminals are as criminals do. Mm -hmm. um, I just won't be able to go to Nigeria and I'll mark that <laughs> off my list. Nigeria is off off the radar. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I have to because I really applaud the work that you're doing. I think it's fascinating, and I think that it's important, uh, and I think it's it's very much aligns with just 
the ethos that I think we all have. I, I, I don't know if it was you that said it or somebody else, but um, this idea, uh, it was you that said it, uh, this idea that it becomes a lot easier to do security when you stop associating yourself with the company that you work for. It's like, so I'll, you know, you can go look at my LinkedIn. You can, you'll know I worked at uh, Darden restaurants. I'll, I'll, I'll say that when you say I'm protecting Darden's data, mm -hmm. it kind of gets old after a while when, when you go through and you're pushing uphill for certain things. And we all deal with this. I'm not picking on Darden that way, but you're saying like, Hey, we really need to do these things. But when you change your mindset to, I am protecting our customers data, it becomes a lot easier to kind of mentally justify really pushing hard for things to get done and fixed. So I definitely applaud you there. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, someone asked a question in the comment about, does anyone get the money back? Uh, once crypto is gone, it's pretty much gone. Like there's, there's real no, and, and these guys would open a new wallet, empty it and then close it out. So there's no way to really track the historical, you know, deposits and withdrawals from that wallet either. Um, Another recent data breach that I found maybe a month ago was all of the Philippines, um, like their NBI, which is Natural Bureau of Investigations, their police force, everything, terabytes of all of their education, their birth certificates, marriage, death, Ooh. photos of them, even their like actual you know, cards, their, their police cards. Badges and ID. Yeah. And it, it, that was, um, for lack of a better term a, a turd storm and they they sent me uh, this like you know summons for an official hearing and and i'm like ah whatever you know I'll just tell them i found it and you know the screen comes on and it's this giant boardroom with probably a hundred people and they they're casting me up on some giant screen and so the philippines is off of my uh tourist list as well now right <laughs> So yeah, there's there's some places that, that I'm probably not well going to avoid. Yeah. So uh, Ryan's got up the screen. Ryan, why don't you share this for us now? Um, we're gonna we're we're almost done with the the introductions here, and we're gonna talk about some topics. But during pre-show banter, we brought this up. I highly recommend, and we'll we'll put it in. Ryan already got it in chat. I was gonna paste it. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Um, so uh, I'm a big maker, and I've been fascinated by what's going on in the maker community in Ukraine. And there's a great article. I definitely suggest you check out that link. Uh, that's from Make Magazine, and it's literally makers in Ukraine modifying quadcopters, building these turbojet stoves uh, to use in areas where power's been lost or uh, for, the, for the, the military themselves. I mean, it's just a fascinating breakdown of just the maker, maker and hacker community going, let's go build some stuff. Um, and I just, I absolutely love it. So uh, yeah, no, it's, it does not surprise me to hear some of the things that you're saying about, you know, people in that part of the world just, you know. Well, yeah, and I can offer a little bit of insight to that as well. Oh, I love to hear you know, it, yeah. uh, so, you know, living there, working there, um, the, how it differs, you know, how it differs from America is, you know, in Ukraine, you can go to college for basically free uh, and not graduate with a quarter of a million dollars worth of debt. <laughs> so, so Cries you have a very an American. You, you have a very educated population, and when the Soviet Union collapsed, um, you know Russia stayed authoritarian, as we all know, and Ukraine, you know, was kind of in this back and forth of we're a democracy. We have, you know, this this criminal at the top that just wanted to take over enterprises. Um, you know, the criminal network. So, you know, traditional things like farming, agriculture, metal, uh, pharmaceuticals, all of that was untouchable. But what wasn't was technology and building things and making things that, you know, would that you could, you know, the Internet created this borderless realm. And now you have smart, educated people who are finding ways to do business, sell products, sell services, and, and not get caught up, you know, in one of these sectors of the economy that was was highly regulated. Um, so it doesn't surprise me to see how technical they are and, and how innovative they are with some of the ways they even modify 
old Soviet weapon systems to make, you know, smart bombs or, or anything like that. So, um, but there is a reason for that. You know, you have an educated population. They, they've always believed that they were European. And, you know, so, so they had freedom of speech and freedom of knowledge where Russia didn't, you know, mm -hmm. and while the leadership in the old days was too busy kind of scrambling for what sector of the economy are they going to get, they left people alone to live their lives. And, and, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely as someone, I was there the day of the invasion, uh, was woke up by air raid sirens drove to the west and then uh stayed there for two days the the town i stayed in was lutsk and it was bombed like an hour after i left and then i spent three days or four days literally sitting in traffic to get across the polish border so yeah it, it's it's personal for me yeah and, no, and what's funny is um I have Ukrainian permanent residence it's it's called posvitka which is the equivalent to a green card and in Germany, I, I'm nobody, you know, I'm an American tourist. They're like, you know, enjoy your three months and go home. Right. And so in their German system, I am the only Ukrainian refugee with a U.S. passport. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> wild. Uh, that is crazy. Right, so, so we have now I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Ukrainian refugee with a U.S. passport. In Poland. Are you really? <laughs> Congratulations, sir. Oh, my God. <laughs> So, uh, so while we were chatting in the background, uh, a bunch of folks jumped in and said, "I, w I want to add in on this this man," which I knew would be a good topic to to kind of bring up. But uh, Klaus, why don't you introduce uh, Leaf for us? Because Leaf wanted to jump in on that, but but they joined us uh, just now. So why don't you introduce him? And then Leaf, why don't you fill us in on uh, what you were mentioning about uh, 3D printing? Yeah, well, uh, life, life is the keynote speaker of Pisa Zoom. Uh, well, tomorrow, we're, 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 he'll be talking about how to hack a country, a practical guide to that. So I'm, yeah, I'm really, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that. So other than keynote, sp keynote speaking, I'd say that life is a general troublemaker, I think. Aren't we all? <laughs> Which is, yeah, but you know, yeah. some more than others, right? Oh, fair enough. So great. So I'll leave, thanks for, thanks for being here. You, you said you had something you wanted to add in about the, the maker scene and whatnot. What was going on? In Ukraine, yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm in Sweden, and as as you know, in Sweden and Russia, we have well, we have a bit of history. no love, no love uh, lost. So when the when the war started, it uh, it was pretty unanimous uh, mm -hmm. in Sweden that uh, we will support Ukraine, whatever whatever it takes. Um, Part of it is, is government support, but a lot of it is, is civil society. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, in, involved in an organiza organization that sends uh, trucks and, and pickups to, to Ukrainian, mil Ukrainian military, and uh, also uh, a network that, well, you know, you're, you see all these drone uh, videos from Ukraine where, where drones drop grenades on uh, yeah. Russian uh, yeah. armored vehicles. Uh, those grenades, those, those are usually 40 millimeter NATO standard grenades. But to be able to drop them, actually drop them from from drones, you have to have some kind of uh, tail on them, uh, like an arrow with with fletching. Mm -hmm. uh, and that part, yeah, exactly yeah. that yeah. part, which. Uh, helps the grenade actually hits it, its targets. That's uh, 3D printed, and uh, the uh, the Swedish part of the organization has has just uh, finished shipping uh, thirty thousand of these tails, oh, or as we call them, thousand? egg cups. Because if you turn them upside down, they look just like egg cups, and that is what we tell the Ukrainian <laughs> customs that they are. <laughs> that's that's incredible. I love that. It's no, no. These aren't these. This this is not something. Uh, oh, what is it? The this is not Wassner arrangement material. It's a cup. It's a cup we drink from it. It's a cup. I mean, it can be a you know used for grenade delivery, but it's also a cup. Yeah, also yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Lock. And uh, sometimes it's it's a it's a flower vase. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Lars, <laughs> you, you mentioned uh, you had something you wanted to add uh, about the three D printing pieces as well. Yeah, but, not yeah. really. That was well, more. We have. Uh, 
a pretty large network of makers that have modded their 3D printers to be able to print these egg cups 24-7, oh. uh, including automatic changing of elements and uh, uh, harvesting the finished prints and so on. Gotcha. Uh, and and it's, uh, it's, it's been um, working out nicely. The um, recipients are very happy. Uh, I'm told there's about a 10% hit rate on these, uh, which means that these uh, 30,000 egg cups has, have resulted in about 3,000 actual hits on mm -hmm. Russian military vehicles, which makes us uh, very, very happy. Yeah, I would, I would say. Uh, what was funny is you said, uh, you said, uh, makes the recipients happy. And I'm like, I'm not sure the, the end recipient <laughs> is quite as happy, but that's probably okay. <laughs> Um, let's, let's go back to large. We haven't dark. heard back from them. Yeah, no, yeah. Well, <laughs> we're still so such dark humor. It's okay. Uh, but uh, Lars, you said you said it was more a generic comment around three D printing, but I want to make sure we go back to you. Oh no, I'm uh, I'm just surprised that we are so many that are into that uh, in mm. this small team. Um, as I mentioned before in the precast, um, I love uh, fixing stuff, but I also love uh, creating stuff. Uh, I think when you have a job where most of it is sitting in front of a computer, basically, um, for me at least, it's good to do something with your hands. So mm -hmm. I've, I've built 3D printers, I've built oh, laser wow. cutter, I've built my own CNC machine, and I'm working on a robotics project. So it's, it's just fun um, kind of breaking the rules and say, what's the worst that could happen if I try this? Um, and, and uh, I guess it's what we do all day, just yeah. um, inside computers. But having it in the real world um, shows its true power. And I'm, uh, I'm so impressed with what the, what's happening in, in Ukraine because it really mm -hmm. shows uh, the power that if you, you break the rules, you can, you can go so much further. So huge kudos to, yeah. to everyone that's inventing stuff um, in order to... Uh, defend that country yeah no I, I i couldn't agree with you more i find it uh not only fascinating but almost to back to the comment originally that klaus uh, was talking about like adhd i find that the people that gravitate towards information security really do kind of fall into two well, i don't want to say two buckets because uh, again not a medical professional can't diagnose people but man are there a lot of neurodivergent folks uh in infosec and you kind of gravitate towards that because when you think differently uh your rules don't apply necessarily like you don't think oh well i can't do that so i guess i shouldn't you're like i wonder what would happen if i did um and then the 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 maker scene as well 3d printing it's like wouldn't it be cool if i could just make this uh and and the same gravitation you see a lot of stuff like uh uh johnny xmas he um originally in the U.S., we have those TSA locks and made the original templates when they accidentally disclosed the photos. Like, I'm going to use a 3D printer to print those keys and was able to do it. Um, so, you know, as technologies come forward to do it, I think the, the hacker scene, the security scene is always like, ooh, what can I, with this new technology, how can I break old rules? So, you know, it's, it's just a tool to say, well, that didn't exist when this security function was created. Does the old security function hold up to, you know, having to deal with this new technology? So I, I totally see it. I think we have one more introduction. Let's go back to uh, Klaus and John. Uh, I think we have one more to do. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Casio. So uh, let me introduce Casio. I just met Casio recently um, in Krakow, Krakow, Poland. Uh, so uh, Casio is one of the organizers of B-Sides Krakow. And, and uh, with that, I will pass the mic to him to introduce himself and talk about what he's doing. And, and yeah, thank sorry, you guys for We do me. have one more, Ian. We've got Lars after Cassio. Still to oh, go. sorry. Forgive me. Yeah, no worries. Thanks. Ken. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me. Uh, as John just mentioned, we just met, basically. Uh, I'm here in Poland, I don't know, two years now. The same reason as John found a woman and move here basically is the is the love story yeah that bring me bring me to europe 
but I'm uh, from Brazil. I'm a good Brazilian, and I know Orlando. It's a mm. main destination for Brazilian. We go to Disney and everything. It's, besides, expensive, but we go. Okay. It's a lot of Brazilian folks are, uh, around there. Mm. Uh, and I started besides Krakow exactly be because you were mentioning something like uh, culture and all these kind of things. And I joined cybersecurity. I don't know. 10 years ago, something like this. I was a software developer before, but turns out that uh, coding is not as fun as talking bad about other people. Code, <laughs> you know? So that's that's why I moved. <laughs> Such an uplifting and, uh, statement. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Whatever. And, and since I, I came, actually, I when I joined cybersecurity, I was, my first conference was beside Sao Paulo, okay. which was amazing because we have free barbecue and beer. And we call that churrasker because barbecue in Portuguese is churrasco and they make this churrasker something. Also, we have game of drones and all these things. So cool. when I joined the conference, I said, yes, I definitely need to leave the coding community and boring events to join this kind of thing. Yeah. Then I joined the cybersecurity finally. Since I moved to Poland and was one of the main things when I arrived here to put my my feet here in the country was where is the first besides I'm going to join and there was besides Warsaw but after pandemic and you know those things guys didn't came back I don't know why I tried to reach them mm. just said oh we, we didn't come back after pandemic and so on but we fully support your initiative so then last year we were able to to run the first besides uh, in Krakow after pandemic but before there was also not besides Krakow anyway and we had I don't know, 100 people more or less with kind of supports for a few of companies and so on. So it was uh, surprising to me, like just starting 100 people, a lot of support and community joining and so on was kind of a bit challenging. You know, a lot of people get used to staying online and streaming, uh, in, even in the local community. But as a good Brazilians, we, we, we like, you know, the contact with person and people in general. Mm -hmm. so. That's how the story is, uh, started. So a little little inside baseball. Uh, whenever we go to conferences and whatnot, and, and John's there, John Strand, the, the owner of the company, everyone generally knows who John is, uh, we often end up at Brazilian steakhouses, at churrasqueries and whatnot. <laughs> that's, that's his thing. And don't get me wrong. I'm like, oh, no, someone's going to bring all this amazing yeah, yeah. meat to my table. That would be terrible. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. big, big fans of that here at Black Hills. <laughs> Um, so no, that's awesome. And I love what you said too about you, you, you moved and you said, I want to make, I want to get more involved in the community and whatnot. And I think that's a, a really key kind of thing that we've heard with all these folks that we've got here today is that they saw a community that they could do something and wanted to be a part of it. And if there, that community wasn't there, they said, well, I'm going to make it. I'm going to, you know, go through and create that community. So I think that's that's absolutely wonderful. Uh, we did have a, uh, it was more of a statement, but I want to ask it as a question uh, in the chat. Uh, Game of Drones sounds amazing. Can you tell us what Game <laughs> of Drones was? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, guys in Sao Paulo and besides Sao Paulo, they just had the idea of setting up kind of a workshop. Okay. It started for kids, so we have the B side. We know, not I'm not anymore, but the guys there they have the B sides kids or, or kids track, yeah, something okay. like this. So, activities for teenagers and, and kids as well, because you know, parents come to the conference and sometimes they don't have uh people or I don't know, they just want to bring in the, 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 the little ones. Mm -hmm. So, they started this workshop for drones. So, basically, there's uh, sometimes companies, sometimes just folks who like drones and they are building drones, mounting, breaking them, making them, them run, they have a race or etc and so on and so forth and they created this game of drones uh, competition and so on but it's basically let's say all the activities are around the building drones and make them work mm -hmm. for kids but of course adults at good nerds that we are mm -hmm. we joined as well and the, they, they need to make separate for kids and for adults to don't have this unfair competition let's uh, say. but still i would say that kids can can be there. that's really cool uh we did <laughs> yeah. at b-sides orlando a few years ago john singer uh who was president uh before me or was he vice president it doesn't matter uh it's a long time in the past but he ran a workshop uh where you could sign up and you paid like i think it was like 120 bucks but you left with a full quadcopter that you had built and, you know, knew how everything worked and how to repair it and whatnot. And, you know, I think it really does speak to the maker hacker kind of community where it's like, I want to be able to build it so I know how to break it, you know, 
and rebuild it and and that that sounds amazing i love i love seeing b-sides where people and it's hard to do i mean it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort so yeah. thank those folks when you do interact with them and they do things like that um but i think it's great i think it's great that people go in they they go wow i they leave and they go i built this I, I, I think I can do this. I think maybe this is a field for me. So that's awesome. We got um, one more introduction to do. I, I actually said one more, and then I was corrected because uh, we, we had already been talking to Lars in the, in the pre-show, and uh, I was like, oh, we must have already introduced him. And I'm a terrible host. So uh, going back to our, our hosts in Europe, John Klaus, why don't you, uh, yeah. why don't you introduce Lars for us? Yeah, Lars is well. Apart from having a Lego addicted wife, he uh, is also a freelance uh, security consultant and also the author of a cool open source product uh, uh, called uh, called Avalanche, which is uh, doing the Windows AD stuff. I'm sure he'll be talking more about oh, it. Oh yeah, let's hear about that. Awesome, Lars. Welcome. What's this? Yeah. What's this Avalanche tool. Oh, we can come back to that in a bit. Okay, think, fair enough. I think I think I'll start by saying um, that I'm I'm really happy to participate in this, but I'm not a B sides organizer. I'm very sorry. I had to tailgate now yeah. to get in, um, but I think the uh, the Copenhagen B sides is really cool. Um, I'm not really into conferences, but that's this conference I go to, so right. and I like it a lot. Um, and I, I was one of uh, the people that voted for the Viking ship logo. I'm sorry, uh, but I think, I think there's something to be proud of, and I think maybe we should consider the opportunity that now that um, England has left the EU to start plundering them again. <laughs> <laughs> good, good idea. Good idea. It is an option. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, is the... I support this motion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, of I'm, course. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Sam. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, yeah, wow. well. Uh, you, you just got a lot of side eye there. That was like. <laughs> yeah. uh, I will be happy to get a uh, Sam plundered for B sides organizing help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's true. Uh, as, as Klaus uh, mentioned, I'm a, I'm a freelance consultant. I've been uh, working freelance um, all of my life. Basically, I'm, I think being employed um, is not working out for me. Um, so, um, so I've been doing uh, lots of crime, uh, basically mm -hmm. in security wise, uh, by not being a proper sysadmin for 20 years. So uh, lots of uh, next, next, next installs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And um, at some point in time, I um, I discovered that that everyone was being hit by ransomware, and um, I hit up uh, one of my uh, my friends and I said, "Hey, we should we should uh, save the world. We should solve this." Um, and he said, "Nope." <laughs> and uh, I said, "I think you need more coffee." And um, <laughs> And we had some coffee, and he said, "All right then." So, uh, so my entry into Infosec was basically, uh, "Let's write an EDR product," and uh, that was uh, that was quite an adventure. Um, so, for three years, uh, we did um, a cloud-managed um, endpoint detection um, piece of software for Windows, and uh, I think it was a success uh, product-wise. It was a complete failure in sales and marketing. So um, so after three years with that, I've been uh, since then, I've been doing uh, security work for some of the larger companies in Denmark, uh, finding uh, all the holes in the cheese for them. Um, yeah, so that's me uh, on the professional side. And uh, since I'm not doing any um, organizing of B sites, mm -hmm. um, I'm doing uh, an open source project. Uh, which was mentioned before, um, mm -hmm. which is called uh, Avalanche, and it's a uh, attack graph tool. Um, I'll just share the GitHub. Yeah, uh, if you could. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's um, it does uh, the pretty graphs. You've probably seen them in uh, in Bloodhound. Mm -hmm. uh, but I thought we needed something from Europe. <laughs> and mm. uh, no, I couldn't help myself. I, I love coding. And uh, I think after doing the EDR thing and just doing security work uh, for a while, I, um, I had to I have to code something. 
and I saw there was a, a problem uh, even in the larger companies. So um, usually I'm very shy with what I do. Uh, but after six months, I thought uh, I need to share this and it, it won't be perfect. It might be a bit ugly and it might not really work. Um, and it's getting traction, I think. Um, and so much that I've uh, launched a commercial version, which uh, oh, does wow. way more. Um, yeah, last year. So rather than just doing AD and doing um, Windows machines, it talks to vCenter and it talks to um, yeah, different CyberArk and different other stuff. So you can do some interesting searches. Wow. So um, and uh, smaller tools pop up as well. I did a, a funny one because uh, doing Avalanche is um, lots of reading on on technical stuff on on AD, and I found a peculiarity on on um, how you can actually do anonymous uh, username lookups. Uh, so you can enumerate um, or you can brute force usernames. So this is uh, one of the smaller tools, which is not. It's just, I think I put maybe 20 hours in it total, uh, but it's very efficient. You can you can brute force, I think, 20K usernames per second, and there's no logging um, in a regular setup. So that's, wow. that's a fun one. Yeah. And uh, another one which I did quite recently with uh, with my friend Daniel Card from uh, from the UK is, uh, is a hash muncher yeah, yeah, yeah. thing, which does uh, it... Um, it dumps via event tracing for Windows. It dumps uh, incoming uh, NTLM hashes uh, to the console or file, and it it requires no uh, no setup. It's just just run it and yeah. Nice. So I'm gonna paste your uh, oh, hold on. Uh, I'm gonna paste your um, your GitHub in there because both those projects are there. So if you are interested in either of those projects and you're watching this, let me show this up on the screen here, uh, there uh, is Lars's GitHub and both the uh, AD Av oh, was it Avalanche uh, and yeah. Ask Muncher are, are in there. And those look really cool. I'm going to definitely check those out because I know we've got a lot of pen testers, obviously, that love GitHub projects like that, that use them a lot. And uh, that, that 20K uh, brute force IDs without triggering logging. That's uh, that on its own is worth the price of admission. Price of <laughs> free, but yeah. I mean, still worth the price of admission. Excellent. So, I think at this point, John, we've we've gotten everybody here, and this is this is lovely. Now, Leaf, you had a, a correction, a historical correction in the uh, in the private chat that we've got in the background. So, so uh, you know, editor's note, uh, if you will. Uh, let me pull this up. Um, uh, it should be pointed out that traditionally Denmark plunders the British Isles while Sweden plunders Russia. So historical edit there, everyone just, uh, you know, be aware of who should be plundering who. Uh, I am a, a neophyte in in <laughs> the European history of plundering. Well, so. well, actually Sweden plundered Denmark and we did it to them as well. So oh it's com I guess it's complicated. I, you know, I think that's probably the best way to say it. It's, it's definitely complicated. Uh, we, we have an internal argument. It's Velda and Noah from our, our anti-siphon training. And uh, they are across the border uh, of two states known for growing corn. And if you get the two of them arguing about who grows the best corn, it becomes, like you said, very complicated very quickly in okay. ways that I could never picture. <laughs> So now I guess I guess not not the same as Vikings plundering and whatnot. But that being said, cool. So John and Klaus, uh, I think I think at this point I'd love to go back to some of those topics and yeah. maybe we go around and start bringing bringing everybody in uh, and and you know talk about those. So what do you want to talk about first? Yeah, let's talk about some cybers. Um, so and and thanks Ian for leading us through all the introductions. I uh, appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so uh, just some random cyber topics for us to, to chime in on and comment on or go deep on, however you want to do it. So uh, data breaches in Europe. Uh, any recent ones that, that we want to talk about that were unique or different or reasons why they happened? Anybody know of any? We don't have them. We've got GDPR. It's fine. No one has a data breach. Yeah, definitely. Agreed. <laughs> nope, nothing to see here. Oh, Moving on now. Hi. Oh my gosh, you've got a hat. You've got a GPR oh, hat. Oh, I need it. I need it. <laughs> we all need it. <laughs> yeah, so, I, mean, I mean, in all seriousness, though, uh, I mean, how do we feel 
this group about GDPR because in the U.S. I know how we treat it. Uh, I like I said, I, I worked at big companies for I don't know why my white balance is going nuts here. I think I've got I got there we go. Um, but anyway, uh, we've got uh, you know big companies that say, hey, we deal with European citizens' data. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the British Isles no longer has to worry about GDPR than the same way that the U.S. does. How do all of you feel about GDPR? Like, is it good? Is it bad? Is it worthless? Like, it's a tool. It's, it's my opinion. You, 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 it's a tool like, ever, like, like any other tool that you can use. You can, do, you can use it pretty wisely and you can use it really bad. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, the intention around GDPR is good and noble, but I've also, I've also, I've also seen it implemented really, really bad, so that it makes my, my wife is a teacher uh, mm -hmm. in, in Denmark, and and in, in many ways she has made it has made the way it has been implemented has made her life harder. But that's not GDPR's fault. That 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 that, that, that that's just because somebody will really want to cover their ass and make it, and make completely sure that they didn't they didn't screw up, so they make it hard really hard mm -hmm. to do on a daily basis. Uh, That's interesting. I'd like to ask you a question about that, if you wouldn't mind. Um, yeah. You say that it's because they're trying to be proactive, and I will I will speak in a very U.S. Uh, Western... Oh, no, pro, proactive. I, I, I wouldn't call it proactive. No, just no? They, okay. They, 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 they want to uh, cover their ass, basically. Well, yeah, but covering... One can say covering their ass is proactive. Right, you're you're saying, sure. hey, I don't, I don't, I, I would prefer my my ass be covered in the future, uh, but my my question really goes to, um, in the U.S., we we you often talk to people and they say we're not going to do anything until somebody gets sued and hopefully it's not us and then mm -hmm. then case law will be established and we'll know what due care and due diligence look like. Um, there, it sounds like they're they're trying to to cover this in advance. So, um, is well, is that I mean, the case, or are you just saying eh, it's just? No, no. Way. Well, of of course, in a in a way, in a way, you're right. I mean, they're trying to be proactive. They just don't have any focus on now that we now that we implementing it like this. How does it actually work for those that have to that has to do this every day, right? So, it, 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 I mean, I mean on, a, on a governmental level, they are being proactive, but on a practical level, it's going haywire because whatever they are trying to, the system that, 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 that they're setting up that doesn't work in a, in a teacher's uh, everyday, everyday life. And, and I mean, then what? What, what? what are we going to do then? Are we going to do, not do as, as told, or are we just going to you know, break the rules? And or what, are, what are we going to do to make our, to make our daily lives work? Got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Klaus. I, I think I I kind of disagree. I'm I'm not much for policy things as a rule breaker, but I think GDPR at least helps um, because you force companies to um, to decide uh, at what level they they need to be um, rather than doing nothing. And doing something is better than doing nothing. Sure. And and I agree, it blocks some stuff, but at least uh, not being allowed to keep uh, data indefinitely, and also uh, the capability of being able to find people that are uh, clearly um, not doing anything. I think it's okay. I think yeah, it, I, I think it helps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. I I I, I don't want to say that that DDPR is bad. I. I I think the best thing about GDPR is that it forces companies to really think hard about which data they really need in the end of the day, because because they, if, if, if they are, if they are having too much data, they go, they they're going to be fined, and and this expensive. And that there are companies like uh, Zoom Info, if if that name rings the bell. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Zoom Info business is collecting personal data and publishing it, uh, and. Uh, well, if you are a U.S. citizen, you can actually email Zoom Info and, and say, "Hey, I'm a U.S. citizen. Take down my data," and 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 they will comply. You know, go ahead. Sorry, I'll, I'll just jump in on that with uh, you know being a, a data hunter for the last decade. Uh, I've I've reported a lot of European data breaches. The thing with GDPR. Uh, it puts a financial penalty on data where a lot of C-level executives, you know, when it comes to a marketing budget, they always have money. When it comes to a sales budget, they always have money. When it comes to their security, 
they'll either farm it out, you know, to the cheapest, you know, lowest cost service provider they can get, or they'll have one or two guys. Um, so now that there's a financial penalty for a data breach or exposing that data, they have to weigh that versus the investment in their cybersecurity team. So in that aspect, it's really good. I mean, America is a, a nightmare patchwork of depending on what state and almost all states have some sort of data breach law, mm -hmm. but it almost never gets, um, you know, it never really gets used or in the fine print. You know, you, you have to expose such a massive amount of data that it always falls below that bar. So GDPR is a good, uh, I, I would say it's a, you know, it's like bringing a, a hammer when you really just need a screwdriver, but it's a, it's a good baseline. Is that the problem? Is that a problem? <laughs> I like always him. carry a hammer. <laughs> Depends on what you want the screw to look like after after you're doing whatever you're doing. Is it going to be useful or not? If, if I, 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 if I may my add, yeah, yeah. Official role is to break stuff. I suppose that's true. Yeah, Cassio. If I if I may add something to this, it's uh, I agree with both. Mm -hmm. We have our technical background, but when we see from the end user perspective. Every goddamn website that we navigate, there is a pop-up or a model screen asking to accept the cookies. Yeah. Where are my chocolate cookies? How do I eat Seriously? them? Where are them? What do I do with them? Oh, yeah. so for how, how, how does this regulation really deals with the end user? What is cookies? What is data? What we're accepting or not accepting? You know, this, this is still a challenge. Matthew, I, 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 I actually like that point because... Um, being living out here now since uh, December, um, I've gotten so accustomed to just those pop-ups that I'm starting to just click them. <laughs> the, 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 and that's really bad for me to say, but it's like cookies. Yeah, it's like it's becoming this mechanical thing every website I visit. Yeah. Yeah. And well, it's that might be bad, right? Well, there, there, there's, yeah. a plug, there's a plugin that does automatically. And, 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 and just, to, just to talk about that's my point. It. My point from before, that's not GDPR's fault. I mean, everybody could yeah, just yeah. Could, could just have QVC say disabled by default, and then you could up could up then, right? It's true. It's that it, it, that is that, that has nothing to do with GDPR. That's the way it has been that that's the way companies are, are implementing it. That was your original point. Yeah, and that, that, that's my original point, is, right? And there, yeah, that, I actually, I, that's a, that's a great way to come back to that point. Yeah, there's always going to be an easy and cheap button to press. And unfortunately, most companies are going to press that button, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. They, 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 they want people to opt out because they hope that people get annoyed like you. And then just say, well, screw it. I'll just grab it and don't think about it. Uh, they also want to uh, have people be uh, unhappy with GDPR and similar legislation, uh, blaming all of these pop-ups on the legislation, not their choice to implement it and uh, being sneaky about tracking. I love that point. I absolutely love it. It's it's malicious compliance, right? You tell an industry you must now be regulated, so they're going to make the regulation as annoying as possible so the customers complain about the regulation and not the fact that the company is doing it. It's oh yeah, agreed on. And it's and it's there is I think the least the, le the latest one uh, security principle which is uh, psychologist acceptance. Yeah, it's exactly like this. We're implementing security but at what cost? In this case, it's like kind of a misservice, something. Mm. Have you have you guys noticed in Europe many American like news websites and other sites? Uh, they just won't comply with GDPR, and it says blocked in your region. Yep. Like I, yep. I need a VPN to read most of my hometown oh, yeah. news. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I've oh, seen. Oh damn time! <laughs> I like. It's the uh, NPR who will actually give you a very nice text-only version of the website. Oh, interesting. Sam, Sam, what were you saying? Yeah, this. I mean, we, can, we can get around it, right? We can get around it. But it is just the laziest thing ever when they go, "Sorry, you fit to be in the EU." Well, actually, I'm not. But that's a different story. Um, and they've just blocked like Europe as a thing because god knows there's no difference between the eu and europe wait a minute um <laughs> there is for friends at home um but honestly i think it's it's it had great intent it's been badly implemented you can't actually be in compliance it's impossible um because you have a legal text 
written by legal people that doesn't provide security people with a list of actually what they need to do, or IT people, or data owners, or anyone really. Uh, there's a lot of, well, you know, it has to be applicable to the risk. But, and okay, you ask three people to calculate risk on one thing, you'll get 17 different answers. Yes. It is, um, yeah, I mean, obviously it got me a hat, and that's good. I got the hat made myself, not just for me. I think about 100 of these are in existence. Um, and then you see what actually the different, um, the fines that are happening around it and the teeth that like, kind of it starts with and then they go back and, oh, wait a minute, when was this? Was GDPR in effect? Um, is it having the right um, influence? Maybe a bit. I think people are being less dickish with data for the most part. Um, but is it actually creating a world where people are thinking more about the security and the use of the data and how long they need it for and do they need it um a little it's not it's not where it needs to be i hate getting asked for my date of birth when i it's clearly not needed and i have to spin the wheel of fortune to get to the damn year that makes me cross as well as all the cookies and the laziness on us websites so, so I'm glad you came back to cookies because Ryan, if you could pull this up on the screen and we'll share the link, uh, it was, I think it was this weekend or last weekend we were driving around and uh, fortuitously enough, it was, it was NPR that did a 26 minute story and you can listen to it or you can read about it, but it was talking to the person who was actually at Netscape who originally created cookies. And it was, it was through this, this kind of lens of, well, we get all these pop-ups now saying, do you accept these cookies? And they talked about originally the cookies, the design was for privacy so that every company didn't need to know who you were specifically. They could put a cookie in there so that when you navigated around pages, uh, you could you know, have things in your shopping cart. When you return back, it would say, oh, this individual, whoever they are, until they give us you know, their shipping information and whatnot, uh, this token is an entity that had these items in the shopping cart and had these items here and you know they prefer the website be laid out like this and da 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 da. So it was actually a really interesting conversation in this story about uh, unintended consequences of good uh, of good actions. You know the the road to hell is paved with good intentions kind of thing. And uh, so it's a great story um I would definitely check it out if if you're interested in in that. I, I do want to ask a question because the original kind of question that John asked was about breaches. Have any of you been involved that you can say uh, in kind of researching or or following up on a breach where you know GDPR has been involved, where one of those groups uh, and I'm, I'm I need to be more familiar with this, but one of the the like Ireland is the one that is often in the news because that's where everyone has uh, put their European basis of operations for taxes and whatnot. But Ireland, that group that handles GDPR there, uh, they're often in the news. Have any of you been involved in those things or have any comment on what it's like to be involved when someone says, you violated GDPR and go from there? Um, I mean, I've not work directly with the company, but I've reported mm -hmm. breaches to the company. Mm -hmm. And on more than one occasion, because there is the financial aspect, they've tried to pay me off. And I, I told them for ethical, <laughs> for ethical reasons and reputation reasons, I'm happy to assist them in their reporting <laughs> to, uh, to the authorities and, you know, to the affected customers. Oh my God. But that, that's a really common thing where they just try to throw money at the problem. Um, and then also I've, I've followed up with them to make sure that they did report, you know, in the event that it was a couple million records or whatever. Um, so not as an employee, but as an outside researcher who sent them a responsible disclosure notice. Um, so I, I don't know the inner workings of the follow-up or, you know, what the process was or what the fines were, but, you know, at the same time, that's why that law exists you know, in theory, is to make sure that the affected individuals are protected. And I always say this, you know, more when I'm working with U.S. companies, you know, these are real people who trusted their data to your company. And you can't just ignore that because look at what identity theft or, or something like that 
the impact that would have on that individual was devastating. And, you know, the company cares about the bottom line and reputation. We get that, we respect that, but at the same time, the, the customer data you're collecting and storing is just as value as the services or products you're providing. And that's kind of like my, my mantra I always say to them. Oh, that's great. That's a, that's a good leeway into the next topic. Yeah. Um, so uh, we just, so I, I'm originally from the state of Maryland in the U S I'm living in Poland now, but we just had a, a massive data breach in, in the government of Maryland move it breach. So, uh, all the public records, you know, the state government had all, so many people. I mean, it's so massive. And they're basically just sending out like, hey, make sure you reset all your passwords. Everything's compromised to everybody in the state. <laughs> uh, so I was wondering if, you know, move it. Um, I, I hope I'm saying that right. That's how I have always called it. But is, is that impacting anybody else? Um, or does anybody is anybody familiar with that? Um, with that yeah have any of you dealt with the the move it breach in europe so for those who maybe are you know unfamiliar with this or what i move it is a large audience members uh the uh move it is a large enterprise basically data movement platform and the way i've always looked at it is it's like sftp with rules uh to say take this move it here uh you know delete the data afterwards and it's it's kind of a really um Shoddy glue to glue old legacy technologies together. I'm sorry, move it. You can send complaints to somewhere. Um, but, you know, a lot of enterprises use it to glue things together. And, uh, yeah, they, they, when you've got a lot of large enterprise data uh, in a target, uh, you can have real problems. So, with that said, um, have any of you dealt with that, that, that breach? Or what advice, if you haven't, you know, what do you think of companies using these types of tools? Are there differences in, in Europe or regulations that they have to look at when they put these types of tools online? Things like that. I, I'm, I, I didn't have involvement directly, but one of the companies that I work for, European, they had a kind of wipeware, new, I don't know if it's new attack, old attack, but wipeware, which was basically wiping your data. But of course, when the bad guys has access to your environment, they will not just wipe for fun. Maybe yes, but usually not. They will, all, all, of course, exfiltrate this data before, especially because it was critical infrastructure company and so on and so forth. So there was this breach, but the main effect, the main damage that they felt, we felt back then, was the uh, missing data because basically you could not recover because they were wiping out either the, um, the live data, let's say, also backups and everything that they could find. So then further, we discovered that it was uh, selling in the black market, some kind of, of uh, credentials and so on and so forth. But this, uh, after the incident response team and, and so on, they came with this name. Why, uh, um, wipeware, and this this came to me like oh new thing. They are just wiping data for fun. Yeah. Of course, again, uh, since they have access to the environment, they will exfiltrate. It's it's uh, kind of their business uh, to sell the data, but especially the the wiping. It's like to me it was like okay, you already got the data. Now you need to erase from the customer from the source. Why from the customer? No, sorry, from the from the victim. Yeah, why does this? <laughs> But it's just just commenting, you know, just just this case. It's funny. No, it is interesting how criminal groups recently, because and, and, and when I was teaching classes, I said this a lot. Uh, ransomware is so prevalent because for a long time it was incredibly effective, and this is not to say that it's not incredibly effective now, but a few years ago it was basically guaranteed that you'd be able to, you know, with enough time and focus as an attack group or a threat actor, you could get into an organization and, and deploy ransomware. But now you see the, the, the wiper where kind of like what you're talking about and then ransomware like 2.0 where we're going to ransom your data, we're going to encrypt it, but we're also going to steal it and we're also going to extort you. That you can't have your data back, so even if you can recover from backups, we still have it and we'll disclose it unless you pay. And I, and I truly think that that pivot is because professionals like all of you and professionals here 
have done better about educating the businesses. And, and there's also a little bit of, you know, the other businesses here, peers and contemporaries and whatnot say, oh, yeah, we got ransom and pff, we were done. And then somebody comes in and says, yeah, we need to do something about this. So it, the criminal groups evolve to whatever the easiest way to make money is. It's pretty amazing. So, um, very good. Uh, yeah, so are there, I mentioned a question about like regulations. We, uh, we, the U.S. claims to have regulations. I, I swear, if you're not in, if you're not dealing with Fed and government sector, not so much. Uh, but are there any things that are different in your countries that when a company, uh, so let's say you go to put something like this, one of these enterprise tools that might share data, is there anything you have to go through to certify it, or is it just like in the U.S. where throw it online and we're good to go? All quiet on the Western front. I don't think there are any regulations that that require any auditing of software that you uh, that you sell like that. Okay. No, no, you, you just go ahead and try it, and if you fail, you get fined. Okay. Uh, the company I worked for in Ukraine years ago had a. The best way to describe it would be a Dropbox clone, um, mm -hmm. and it wasn't that caused them to close it down it was copyright violation because copyright. people were uploading yeah people were sharing music and oh. movies and different things like that so we were getting you know legal takedown notices every day and it ended up being so much of a pain in the ass that they they sold that product off but i don't remember at that time and of course this was a while ago it's like 2005 or something mm -hmm. um but i don't remember any sort of legal regulation for that Gotcha. Yeah. And I, I ask out of pure ignorance, um, because I like I, I said kind of earlier, I'm often jealous and envious of things like right to repair in, in Europe and, and how that's the consumer and how they're able to use the things that they buy is generally at the forefront, where is in the U.S., uh, you know, good, bad or indifferent. Uh, I have my own opinions. Uh, it's often more corporate and intellectual property focused uh, to say, no, you can't, you can't touch that. You can't put it online. You can't do whatever. Uh, you can't break it unless you get our permission and we're not giving you permission. So I was, I was hoping maybe there was something like that to say, no, before you put it online, you got to get it tested and certified, but you know, it's good. I guess, I guess it's good to know we're all kind of in the same boat. <laughs> you know? uh, maybe you should look into the uh, upcoming EU Cyber Resilience Act. Oh, okay. Yeah, tell, me, tell us about that. Yeah. <laughs> so this is uh, much too complicated for me to try to explain in detail, but uh, it's uh, basically putting the onus on producers, makers of products uh, that they need to get their products certif certified before they can sell them. Interesting. Uh, who, who becomes yeah. the certifying body or have they decided that yet? Uh, well, yeah, that's a part of the complicating right, things. right. Yeah. yeah, we've we've tried to kick off. I mean, best of luck to the folks doing that because I know I think it was Mudge who was part of the Loft, but I, I could be yeah. mistaken. They were brought in to start basically in the in the U.S. We have underwriters laboratories, which you you know it's from the insurance industry, and it says, hey, you're going to make this product that if it caught fire could burn down a house, so we're going to test it for engineering standards and things like this and then you get a little ul label um they were trying to start something like that for cybersecurity, and it went about as well as you might expect <laughs> you know everyone's like well yeah. by whose standard by what by this by that and then it all fell apart it seems engineering and electrical standards of what catches fire and when is is much easier to explain which is terrifying um all right yeah. john you want to we want to roll into a different topic maybe uh I, i'd love to hear about that underwater sea cable thing that was well, pretty interesting I, actually, Ian, we had a really good yeah. comment that leads oh, into yeah. our topic. So, yeah, from yeah, James, yeah. Um, how James long did the yeah. actors okay. start offering a yearly service to the general public where they remove your data from the breaches? So, one of the topics that I had selected for us that Klaus and I were talking about was malware as a service. How does everybody feel about mm -hmm. that? 
again, stunned silence. So I, I want to go over. Like it's a uh, business that I am not going to start. <laughs> Why not? There's so much money to be made. Exactly. Right. Uh, I, I'm incompetent at it. <laughs> and there might be other trouble coming. I was going to say, I'll post my affiliate link in the chat. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, affiliate link. So uh, an interesting thing, uh, a data breach I discovered maybe five, six months ago was a Chinese company that was selling access to like Netflix, HBO, Disney Plus, and, and they would sell. And I could never find out. I suspect some of them were hacked. I suspect. Um, but they were selling them for pennies on the dollar. And when I was digging through their database, they were also selling, you know, like WhatsApp crackers and different types of malware that you could configure on the phone or, um, you know, of course I didn't install any of them or, or look any deeper, but in that data breach, I accidentally discovered that these guys were also selling malware as well as access and uh, there was, you know, keys to Microsoft Office and and lots of different things. China uh, is probably the biggest. I mean, of course, as we know here in this room, uh, probably one of the biggest threat locations. I mean, there's, there's almost every day there's something else coming out, uh, whether it's self-replicating malware or ransomware. So, you know, we pass all of these laws. We have, you know, fines and and data protection laws, but what do we do about that? You know, that's the, the, the real issue. Yeah. No, yeah. I, 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 yeah. I, I, the reason I made that noise there, as you said it is, uh, you know, as someone from the U S I see what California is doing with the CCPA, the California consumer protection act. And I think it's great because it's much more aligning with, with GDPR, but yeah, like, what do you do if, if you don't have that, um, so yeah, no, that's uh, definitely definitely an issue. Um, let's go back here because I do want to touch. You, you touched on the you know you, you're you've been in Ukraine. Um, and going back to the comment from from James, I'm trying to there's lots of good chat, which is great. Um, but yeah, how long before major threat service? So a lot of those threat actors that are doing this malware as a service, right? They operate. Uh, you know, they used to operate in Ukraine, they've operated in Belarus, they operate in, in Russia. Uh, Y'all are much closer to this. Um, why do you think there's such a concentration of threat actor groups in that part of the world? I have my opinions, but I'd like to hear it from people who are kind of closer to that region. Why, why do we have so many threat actor groups that are doing business models in that part of the world? In Russia, for example... It's semi-state sponsored. Uh, many of the ransomware groups that come out of Russia actually put a feature in the ransomware that if you have a Russian language computer, it uninstalls itself uh, or fails to launch. I heard and, that if they see a keyboard driver. Yeah. And yeah. Luckily, I have Ukrainian and Russian installed on mine. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, a, another thing, you know, in Ukraine... Before the war, the law enforcement wasn't at that level to really catch them unless Interpol or, you know, the FBI cyber crimes unit said, hey, we found this. Here's the evidence. Shut it down. Um, so a lot of times it would be a smaller group just operating in a safe haven. Uh, there is this case and, and this is several years ago, and I knew several people who worked uh, for this company. So they made Scareware. And Scareware is basically a pop-up that tells you, you know, you've got 5,000 viruses and key loggers and everything. And then for $10, you get a script that just basically stops this pop-up from showing up. <laughs> and this guy had made, he was, he was, he had Indian citizen, citizenship and American citizenship. And he was based in Ukraine and he had a, a nice glass office Lots of people work there on other projects, not even knowing that they were making scareware. And um, so the guy had made somewhere around $5 million. Wow. And so the FBI comes to, you know, their Ukrainian equivalent at the time. And this was under Yanukovych, who, who was, you know, a Russian plant and said, 
you know, we, we want this guy arrested. He's, he's got $5 million, you know, in, in fraudulent money. And so the authorities went to him and said, look, the Americans said you had 5,000, give us three and we'll leave you alone. (laughs) So, um, that's changed now, you know, that's really changed in a big way. They take it very serious because they want to be a part of Europe. They want to be a part of, uh, you know, a modern investment society. So, but there were stories and the reason that people operate from places like Nigeria or Russia or even North Korea, it's semi-state sponsored, or you're just in a place where law enforcement is three steps behind you. So my those experience you heard, is, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah. My, my experience is that uh, well, Ukraine is not perfect, but you can get people arrested there. Russia, no go. You can, as a Western law enforcement agency, issue an Interpol red notice, mm-hmm. which is supposed to make all Interpol members grab this person on site. It doesn't work that way in Russia. The only thing a red notice makes happen in Russia is that the person get warned that they are onto you. So I have had, uh, I have uh, collaborated in arresting Russian individuals and uh, uh, it's, it, uh, it, it's, it's a different world. You can't get anything happening in Russia. It's totally, utterly corrupt. Interesting. Uh, so I, I, the, the, I said I have opinions, and I'll share mine, mine now. And I've, I've mentioned it on other webcasts, where I've said part of it is the education system, and and what I said was, and I think somebody else said this here, might have been Jeremiah. Um, you had all these, if you had the merit to go to school to become a computer scientist, you could. Uh, you'd go and, and get a world-class degree in c- computer science, and then you'd graduate with no job prospects because you, you live in a country that can't do business with many other countries, and now you've got this dearth of, of computer scientists that are brilliant and nothing to do and no way to put food on the table. So they go, well, wait a minute, I'll, you know, how about crime? And, you know, make a bunch of money. And then it goes into your point as well that these are bulletproof hosts. They've got law in their pocket. They'll drag their feet on the, the, the things. And you put those two things together and you get these these threat actor groups that can basically operate with impunity. Um, uh, so when you get more towards... You compare Go ahead. With Romania. Mm-hmm. Uh, Romania used to be one of those countries. Okay. Uh, that's not the case anymore. Really? What What do you think changed? You, you still get criminals in Romania, of course, but but right. it used to be that one of the languages you learned to recognize when you looked at malware was Romanian because all, all the malware was Romanian. Uh, that's not the case anymore. If they have cleaned up their act, there's still corruption, but not at all at the same level. If you look at the people working at Europol, the uh, EU uh, Common Police Agency, there's quite a lot of Romanians there because they have sort of grabbed this and, and gone with this. So they are really good at investigating cybercrime. That's awesome. Sam, could you talk to a little bit? You put in the chat, I'm going to pull it up on the screen here. Um, so there was a podcast, the Lazarus Heist podcast about North Korea. What, what is that? Uh, this is amazing. I, North Korea, I know it kind of sits on the periphery of like when we talk about like the, the APT groups and everyone goes, Russia, China, Russia, China, because you know they're the only bad people in the world. Sarcasm. Um, <laughs> the Lazarus Heist is just an incredible, incredible piece of um, investigative journalism by Jeff White, and I forget the lady's name now. I, make, I want to make sure she gets credit as well because she is just super freaking cool. Um, the pair of them work together on investigating a whole bunch of stuff around the Lazarus Group in North Korea. In North Korea, actually, go to, they go to the schools and they find kids that are good at maths. And they're, they're getting pulled out very, very quickly to go and learn this cool computer stuff with the government. Um, 
the Lazarus group has been very far reaching. Um, if I said want to cry, you might say Lazarus group, or you might not. But mm -hmm. um, please go and listen to this um, or read it. There's one book out at the moment. Um, the second book is coming. There's been two series of the of the um, the podcast, and it's on everything globally that you can find a podcast. I'm sure. They have had their fingers in so many pies. It is um, it is quite something, according wow. to the investigative journalists that have done this. So I will throw some more links in the chat. Um, this goes way beyond computers as well. North Korea have, have, have been, been up to quite a lot of things, according to, to Jeff and his colleague. Yeah. Well, there was the some EP. talk about the Lazarus Group literally funding North Korean operations. I think it was the Lazarus Group, so y'all correct me if I'm wrong. Funding North Korean like government operations by stealing Bitcoin wallets. Uh, am I remember it's the same group, correct? There's so much they've done. There's Bitcoin stuff. They nearly bankrupted Bangladesh as a country. Really? Um, Sony Pictures. Sony Turns Pictures? Out, make, yeah, yeah, if you make movies about like supreme leaders, like people get fed up with that. Like, yeah. So, yeah, James Franco that. and uh, oh, what's his name? He's got the <laughs> laugh. Uh, yeah. What's his name? But anyway, they, they did a movie for those listening who maybe didn't hear it. It was called The Interview. And they were yeah. journalists. It was a comedy sent. Uh, the journalists went over to, to interview the Seth Rogen. Uh, Seth Rogen, thank you. Uh, they went over, and, the, and I think it's like the CIA or some other clandestine operation. Said, You're going to be close to them. We need you to assassinate them. And it's a weird comedy from there. Yeah, well, it turns out North Korea didn't take that very well, and they they hacked Sony Pictures, uh, and uh, to expose a bunch of dirty laundry in, in email about things and cause them a bunch of yeah. trouble. So, yeah, there were lives that were destroyed. Philippines, I know that came up in the free chat. Um, it's one of my favorite places in the world. Not all of us can go in the Philippines, it turns out. Um, but yeah, Philippines were involved with some of this. It was a huge, huge, huge. I mean, that, like global activity going on with the Lazarus group um, from things from dodgy ATM cards. This is the Bangladesh, like the, the big bank heist they talk about, but there's so mm -hmm. much more. And it's, it oh, is this is the, the swift, swift banking breach, correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, it's tied to it. so they were in, they were in the Bangladesh bank for a long time and then basically, yeah, allowed with through swift allowed lots and lots of people over a very small time period to pull money out of ATMs and take it to some handlers they get some cash and off they go into the ether and they had no idea what they were a part of. Yeah. Meanwhile, back in Bangladesh, things were not good at all. Money was flying out all over the place as well as then transfers happening to other banks. Um, it was, yeah, there was so much that happened in a very short space of time. The orchestration behind this was mind blowing. So, um, I don't want to give the whole book away. And the whole oh book no. Away. Yeah, no. Um, Another podcast on this, and this is like Janelle. I think this is where I'm remembering this from. Darknet Diaries did a story on the Bangladesh bank heist, uh, which is is really good. And I, I think this is where I heard the one bit about the laundering. And I, I will give this away. And correct me if I'm wrong. If someone has more info on this, the thing that I found fascinating, and it does speak to you know international items is the part of the way they got the money out because it was such a large amount of money in the first couple transfers for this uh, bank heist that they did through the SWIFT transfer network is they wired it to a casino, I think in Macau, and said, we're going to be high rollers and we're depositing something like $100 million and we want your best room. And they were playing a game that was chosen specifically because as long as they didn't drink too much, they could have a bunch of good food on the casino's dime. And as long as they played conservatively they would only lose 10 percent and they had planned on losing 10 percent of the house and playing for like 24 hours and then taking it back and now the money's washed it came out of the, the casino yeah. and then they went into the atm things that you're talking at least it's yeah as I remember it. yeah there's back rat is the game and back with rat. Back rat, yeah it's 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 very very simple to, to kind of break even and the, the it was yeah. the, the um casinos from the philippines as well so they had, the staff thought something was up because these guys turned up, they didn't look like high rollers. Um, mm -hmm. and they didn't seem very excited about winning and they certainly weren't betting on anything risky. Mm -hmm. But by the time I think they raised the flag, like mon so much money had, had been yeah. washed through that and then got oh, onto planes and yeah. various other things. Yeah, you guys want to, 
you know, if a hundred million dollars and we get to keep, you want to give us a million dollars for some, you know, shrimp cocktail and some good drinks for, well, we're like, okay, fine, whatever. You know, if I was, you know, Leaf, you, you said uh, you've got some personal experience with, with the Lazarus Group. What what did you deal with with them? Uh, I, I used to work at the company that uh, dealt in uh, tracing cryptocurrency transfers. And a few years ago, I was at the conference. I had forgotten my laptop charger. So the only platform I had was my phone. And during that conference, I got thrown into doing incident response uh, for a Singaporean crypt exchange that had been hacked by Lazarus. And that was kind of scary. Wow. Okay. So the, the crypto, the, the actual message exchange was broken? What? I'm sorry, what got broken? Uh, the, the crypto exchange itself. Wow. Basically, they were able to get the CEO to install malware on uh, her laptop. And from there, they went and uh, got access to the cold wallets. Mm. And, uh, well... Uh, now, once and, you got the cold uh, wallets, you're done. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, that's... Uh, but the, the thing that uh, scared me... Mm -hmm. was, wasn't really the uh, technical level of the intrusion because that was not not that uh, outstanding but the work that had got gone into uh, establishing personas because they, this was a social engineering attack and they had spent many months spinning up these identities uh, there was this guy in in copenhagen with 300 plus uh, uh, connections on LinkedIn, all real people, and blah, 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 blah. And uh, so, so it, it was a really believable backstory that led this CEO to actually install the malware on her laptop. Oh, wow. uh, and that was mm, uh, kind of an eye opener. Yeah, who, no, who I didn't. Draft. I never really thought about social engineering out of the Lazarus group and, and those, those groups, because I mean, that's, you know, if you're convincing them to install that, uh, you, you, you'd really have to have a lot of native language skills or at least some level of trust for the, the, the pretext to work. And this is on my mind, by the way, personal note, uh, and I haven't announced it publicly yet, but I'll, I guess I'll do it now. Um, I'm one of the competitors this year at DEF CON for the, the social engineering community vision competition. Mm -hmm. So social engineering, I'm deep in, in OSINT and, and whatnot right now. So when you're like, man, social, I'm trying to imagine a North Korean threat actor trying to social engineer someone who potentially is a completely different native language and doing it. That's like a, a complete ah. level thing. Ian, Ian, this yeah. is great leeway here. I want... I Klaus yeah. and I were just talking about this. We're talking about these topics. I was like, you know, let's talk, have a topic about AI. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, right. AI is making malware. We're, uh, we have AI, you know, making defense mechanisms against malware. All this, that's where I've, all the conversations I've heard. But life had, or I'm sorry, Klaus had a very different uh, perspective on his fear of uh, what AI could be doing, things like ChatGPT. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, it all it all boils down to me, of course, having been in the game for a while and also not being native American. Because back when I started with security, people were always saying that, well, it's scam scams aren't going to be that big, be that big a problem because they'll never be good enough at Danish, right? So, so what happened in recent years is that Danish native speakers are are calling up um, old people. Because, because you can see in Danish, you can see from their name if if they if they're over a certain age, uh, and, and they're probably not very technical apps, especially not not if they're old women, and uh, they 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 started targeting them and scam them, and and it's uh, unfortunately very successful. But but what what we were talking about is that AI actually helps helps with that doing scamming, doing social engineering stuff in in smaller languages. A, a couple of I think it was last month I heard about a, a project uh, with, that the OpenAI had with uh, the Faroe Islands because obviously that's a very small language because they want AI, chat GPT to understand a small language like that. But the point is that, that can, that's a double-edged double -edged sword. I mean, if, if chat, chat 
GPT becomes better at a small language, it's also much better at uh, assisting a social engineering and doing their attack, right? Yeah. Yeah. There was there was a few cases not that long ago uh, about you know uh, deep learning algorithms that had gone through and uh, spoofed voice calls, and there's a lot of people that said, eh, you know, they they said it was a, a deep fake, but it's just as likely it was somebody impersonating their voice. Uh, I, I think my question to the, the the panel here, the group of folks, is you know how worried are you in your roles? about i don't you know how ai is being used for security we could go deep down in that but how worried are you just about ai in general like is it being regulated properly in the countries you're in are the politicians or people talking about uh you know what's going to change as this technology becomes more prevalent as personal opinion I believe that if they're developing AI softwares as they develop a commercial software, it will fail soon enough. No, just a joke. Uh, is thing, it though? <laughs> no, the thing is like, uh, as I was software developer before and commercially speaking, companies are more focused on, the, on delivering. Delivering means uh, business running, not exactly with the quality needed or even security needed. But the point is, with the AI, I think everybody now is using, they are delivering, people are using it, etc. And these problems or the dark side of it will start soon pop up. It's already popping up. And then we're going to react to this. I used to say that security people are the Avengers. Yeah? After shit happens, we call the Avengers. We do not do Prevengers. Yeah? So I think we'll, we are going to be reacting to these things as soon as they... Um, happen but so far i mean my perspective is like either governments either uh, either you uh, developers people in general we are just excited and using but there are hours already on this and, and so on as we just talked but my, my personal perspective is like we will be reacting as we always have been doing on, on the it uh, hmm. market so far I I would tend to yeah, Sam you you put something in the chat here that I think it's definitely worth talking about what is, what is this this is artificial intelligence act EU what is, what is yep. that here we go again here we go. <laughs> bring in everyone everyone do you have a, head, do you have a rat a head for this bring in the regulators <laughs> click on the wrong uh, one. I do you think we should we should refer to it as I rather than AI because that's funnier if you've um, ever watched Ali G that makes me much happier. Um, so, I mean, there's a thing on the website that, that I've just put that's absolutely, there's two things on there, right? Um, it's not where it needs to be, is, is the short version. There's a lot of loopholes, exceptions. Um, they're still trying to build this thing out. The biggest thing I think that worries me right now is that it's kind of, it, it says here it's inflexible, right? So you can't label something um, retroactively as high risk. And, and that is a problem. Um, so there's, there's a lot on there. I think we've got to see how this thing shakes down. I'm glad that it's happening. What do you, what do you mean? Can you go back to that? You can't retroactively Apparently. label something as high risk. What, what, what do you mean? Like yeah, once it's, it's gone through this like, review process, right. you can't go back so and say it's not safe. If it's used in an unforeseen sector, it says it's no mechanism to label it then as high risk. Um, there's a whole separate page about this. So it's, I think the, again, the attention is good. Right, the sentence is good that we need to have something because everyone's gone AI insane, right? Or I sane? I don't know. It just seems like I mean, I, I walked around in Facebook Europe and, and like every single security vendor pretty much has gone. We've got AI and we've got AI and we've got AI. Everyone's got AI now. And when six months ago, like we were saying, AI didn't really exist, and now it definitely really exists, and everyone's got it. And mm -hmm. it, it's as I'm sure many of you that are listening, watching know. Um, it's good in theory. I like the fact that we can get computers to do things quickly for us and like help us with decision support and all those good things, right? But I mean, stick stick your name into ChatGPT and see what it tells you about you. And I guarantee, oh, well, I guarantee, I bet it would be around fifty percent accurate. Um, I asked it to write me a LinkedIn profile, and like the universities I've been to are quite something. I've not been to university, but I have, according to ChatGPT. 
okay, two different okay. ones depending on like what I typed in. And that's just the beginning of it, that it's not accurate. No one's holding it to account for being accurate, not really. There's a little bit of, uh, there's some lawsuits happening already, I believe. Got this act coming in now for EU, not for me, um, which I think is needed because we need to be able to regulate it. We need to put these guardrails in place. But again, if this is being written by people who want to write it in legalese, because honestly, it just comes back to suing somebody, that doesn't really impact you know, what this could do to people's lives. Like lawsuits are all well and good, okay, but the damage is done. And, you know, m money's great. I'd rather be sat on a Ferrari than a bus. But, you know. <laughs> well, I've heard the phrase, I've said it for, I'd rather cry cry in my Mercedes than my Honda or something like that. Right. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I like crying in my Honda. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to have to read through this because I honestly had There's not. I, I think that's the value of these types of conversations when we bring in, you know, more of a global perspective. I had not seen this. And we, we were talking about this. I'm actually on a panel in July at Full Sail University, and they were bringing me in. And I, you know, I was going to talk about some of the AI stuff that I'm I'm aware of, but this is this is definitely coming up um, because I've not seen anything other in the U.S. than the founder of OpenAI going before Congress and basically saying, "Yeah, we should probably be regulated," and Congress going, "Yeah, maybe I, I don't know." Uh, which which really just warmed my heart. Uh, Life, you you had uh, an additional comment on this, or I'm sorry, no, Lars, uh, forgive me. Lars did. Lars, forgive me. Yeah, yeah no problem. Uh, yeah, I do uh, several actually. I think um, Sam is um, is very spot on, and the the cat is out of the bag, and you can't really. Um, you can you can try to do policies, but the bad guys they don't really care, um, and that's that's from from the oh every, everything will turn bad and someone will abuse this but i think a bigger problem uh, really is that uh, ai is by about uh, creating something that mimics uh, people and and scalability so as soon as we reach the point where you eliminate uh, the need for a certain percentage of the global population because it can be automated you will end up with a society problem because what are those people going to do how will yeah. they live and and as that progresses more and more people will become redundant and and larger corporations will have um, more people fighting over the same jobs so that the the, the wages will be pressed and go down mm -hmm. So, so you are centralizing, you are accelerating the centralization of, of um, money and power with AI. I think, I think it's a scalability issue that worries me the most. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I think science fiction, there's no shortage of science fiction going all the way back to the you know, early 1900s that, that warns us of uh, you know an advanced technology being able to think beyond our capabilities and and we already have definitions for that in ai we already have ideas around when when we get to a certain level we'll no longer be able to understand why the ai made a decision but we'll know that it was the right decision and that concept terrifies me beyond rational comprehension um, but let's go back to the, Ryan, if we go back to the wide view of, of, of everyone, not, not to end on that, that dour note, but, um, we've got about an hour left in this webcast. And one of the things that we wanted to do was play a game of backdoors and breaches with everyone. And, and it kind of introduced you to the game. And if you do run a conference, great, you know, let us know. And we can talk about how we might be able to support you, uh, sending these games out, et cetera. But um, wanted to play a game. So, so in, in the private chat here, uh, just show a hands. Uh, how many folks have heard of backdoors and breaches? There are some that haven't. Okay. Oh, this is great. Okay. So a few that haven't. <laughs> like, what, one finger. Like, eh, yeah, sort of maybe. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, so yeah, backdoors and breaches. Uh, we wanted to play with the European team. And I'm going to ask each of you a question too, because, uh, uh, I know it, where many of you are from, there's actually lots of languages that are spoken natively. I speak English and bad English, which I think is a line from a, uh, an, um, an action movie. But either way, Backdoors and Breaches is a card game developed by Black Hills Information Security. And we're not going to use the decks, but you can, right? 
you can go through and actually play this live, uh, and it is an incident response tabletop. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, it is an incident response tabletop game, and you can go to www.backdoorsandbreaches.com. And I'm going to uh, actually end up sharing my screen in a second, uh, but there's instructions on how to play, there's videos on how to do it, but we're going to use the virtual edition today and, and play this game. And essentially what it is, is it is a game that will help you very quickly have an incident response tabletop exercise conversation with people. I run these all the time with with clients and the curious and and whatnot and we we do them just like this so is everyone game to play you will we'll jump in if you're like no i'm out i don't play i don't play card games but everyone game to play you want to learn how to play and and we'll go through it and and we'll do this live yeah yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. okay it's it's giving everyone so cool. a fail. <laughs> everyone's like no absolutely <laughs> not all right, so I'm going to share my screen here, Ryan. Uh, let me go through here, and generally I do this in Zoom. So uh, this is, all right, let me go entire screen. Perfect. There we go, share. All righty, Ryan, I should have my screen up there. Perfect. So if you go to backdoorsandbreaches.com, uh, what you will find is a page that gives you lots of information on how to play. I'm going to lead you through the basic rules today, and then we're going to play a game. But for those who are new to it, or if, you, if you're if you joining us watching the webcast, you never heard of it, uh, you can go to this page and check out how to play. Uh, can you stretch it to fit 16 by 9? Uh, no, it's on my one... I mean, I theoretically could uh no ryan unfortunately i can't i'm sorry or at least not quickly um so um that being said uh we've got uh you go to backdoorsandbreaches.com and there's not only how to play but there's also some webinars that you can watch so if you're like oh i don't really like the way in right i wonder how somebody else runs it we have the wonderful jason blanchard who has also uh run one of these webinars and recorded it so you can see how they run a backdoors and breaches of exercise, and everyone has different styles, which is one of the neat things about the gameplay. So uh, you can go here and read more, but I'm going to lead you through it. I just want to point you to where you get more information. The thing you really want to go to is this printable visual guide. Um, and the printable visual guide looks a lot like this. So backdoors and breaches here, uh, it takes you through a little bit of the gameplay, but here's how it's played. Right. Essentially, you will be the defenders. All of you in this panel will be the defenders, and I am the incident master. Sometimes we call it incident master. Sometimes it's captain. It just depends on your environment. But in this manual, we refer to it as incident master, and I am setting up a scenario that you have to discover to shut down a breach. And we do that by going through 10 turns of using procedures from the card game and kind of talking it through. Now, the fun thing about this, or fun, uh, you know, depending on how you define fun, uh, the fun thing about this is you can do it completely randomly. You can just pull random cards. That's not what we're going to do today, but you can just pull random cards and work through discovering a fake breach. The other thing you can do is you can pull cards that more associated with your business or the problem you're trying to solve, or to see if you're protected against a certain type of breach and you go through and say, oh, this company just had this breach. Let me pull these cards out because that's pretty close to this breach. And let's play this game with the team and talk through how we would solve this. And we actually use this to do incident response tabletop exercises. So this is what's going to happen, right? Essentially, uh, there's going to be a series of cards. And the way we break this out is there are four uh, areas, right? There are four basically parts of the attack chain where you have the initial compromise, how the person or the threat actor got into the environment. You have the pivot and escalate. So once they're in, how did they move about the cabin? How did they get around? How did they discover more assets? How did they escalate their privilege to be able to uh, achieve their actions on objective, whether it be ransomware, stealing data, we heard about wiperware, that kind of thing. And then uh, how do they maintain persistence? You know, how do they stay in there once you discover them? Have they put in new services? Have they put in new tools? Have they shimmed applications? What have they done? And then finally, C2 and Xfil. Uh, are they just controlling systems to pivot further? Are they stealing data? What are their actions on objectives? So you need to discover all four parts of that attack chain to stop the breach. And you have 10 turns to do this. Well, how do you do it? right? You do that with procedures. So we have a series of procedures, right? Those are in each deck, and you'll see them in the visual online game that I'm about to show you. But you have two types of procedures. You have written procedures, and then you have all the rest of the procedures, 
right? And these procedures are things that are very common. You'll see up here, firewall log review, using your, using your seam, uh, things like that, right? If your organization is incredibly good at firewall log review, you've written it down, you can hand it to an intern, they know what to look for, everything's just an oiled machine. What we do is we give you a plus three to any role where you're using that procedure. Is there a link for you following the roster? Uh, I'm going to pull that up. So uh, Lars, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. we got a private chat going in the background. So um, with that said, the procedures. When you say, all right, on turn one, we're going to use our firewall log review procedure. What's going to happen is you are going to, well, we're going to roll a die. Now, I can roll this die for you, though there's also plenty of ways that you can roll it. And I generally prefer everybody else roll it. So if you have a 1d20, you can roll it there, and I'll believe you. Uh, or you can use a Google dice roller where you go to Google and type in roll a die, and you choose the 1d20. Or in the game, which I'll show you in a moment, there is a die roller in there as well. So you're like, wait a minute, and you haven't explained what, what the die does. Well, yeah, it determines if your procedure was successful. So if you roll a 1 through a 10, procedure failed for whatever reason, right? And we'll talk through some of the reasons why a seam, like say you use the seam or the firewall log review. Why would that have failed? And when you're working with someone in an environment, you ask them the question point blank, why in your environment would this have failed? And it allows people to think through, oh, we didn't put that firewall into the seam yet, or oh... We don't have the appropriate level of logging turned on. Maybe we should look at that. Often the failures are much more revealing about things that you might want to go do. Because it's very easy to say, oh, well, we have an incident response plan and we would check our firewall logs. And you go, excellent, you checked the firewall logs and you found everything. Yeah, that's not always how that stuff happens. As a matter of fact, it rarely happens that way. Often you're looking for little scraps of information to, to piece together. Now... If you use one of the written procedures, the thing you're really good at, and you roll an eight, well, generally that would fail. But because you're so good at it, and you wrote it down, and you practiced it, and all that good stuff, you get a plus three modifier to it, and now you've got an 11. And if that card would reveal something, if your dice roll says, yes, you were successful with it, if that card would reveal something... I, as the Incident Master, flip over the card for you. And I'll, I'll zoom in on one of these cards here in a moment, but each one of these cards for the, like, say, the initial compromise, the fish. Detection in the game plan, I realize there's lots of ways to detect a fish, keep in mind it's a game. Uh, firewall log review and endpoint security protection analysis. Those two cards, if rolled successfully and the initial compromise was a fish, I'd say congratulations, you discovered that the initial compromise was a fish, I would flip it over, and we would start working through the other four, I'm sorry, other three cards, right? There's one last thing to know about procedures. When you use a procedure, it goes into a cooldown period. So for three turns, it cools down. You can't use it again. And people go, well, wait a minute, why can't I just search my seam forever? Sure, you could. Absolutely. But... Often what ends up happening is if you don't find something, you'll move on. You'll say, okay, I'm not finding any seam. Let me go look directly at the logs. And you'll kind of go over there and you'll focus on that. But I like to use the successful part. Let's say you go into the seam and you start looking and you find something. Most of the time you go, oh, I found something. Now let me go to these other systems and see if this bit of information reveals anything else. IP address, MAC address, host name, whatever it may be right? So you go to those other systems. The example I like to use is if your car keys are lost, when you find them, you do not continue looking for your car keys, right? You stop. You go, great, I'm going to go drive my car now. It's kind of the same thing in my mind from a gameplay perspective. If your card reveals something, you don't go, well, let's keep looking in there and see if we find something else. You say, great, now I will go and try these other tools and see if I can find something more. It's also just to make sure from a gameplay mechanic that you're talking about all your controls in your environment. So that's essentially it. Um, there are a couple other rules here. Um, and that's where I said zoom in on this. See uh, detection, firewall, log review, endpoint protection. If it, if it reveals it and you're successful, it goes into a cooldown. Two other rules. 
Um, well, actually, one, because we don't play consultants when we do this, uh, is Inject. So if you've ever done a tabletop exercise, you're familiar with the term inject. But what an inject is, is something new, something you didn't know before, something, a new bit of information that is given. And the gameplay mechanic behind this is just because you're dealing with a breach doesn't mean that your business stops. And sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes that's a bad thing. Sometimes it's somebody came back from training and they are just gung-ho ready to dig in there and use some new techniques in the seam. And other times, like the example up here in, in the U.S. FMLA, for those of you in Europe are going to be like, what? Uh, FMLA, Family Medical Leave Act, often people, when they have a child, have to go on FMLA and it's protected government status. That just means you can't be fired, but you're not getting paid while you're on parental leave, which, again we can go into a completely different discussion about that. Uh, but um, your lead handler has a baby, congratulations, and they leave and they're completely unavailable. So if you were to get that inject card, if one of you was the person who was really chiming in a lot and really leading the conversation, I'd be like, nope, you are silenced now. You can't speak anymore because you are now on leave. Congratulations on your new baby. But they have to figure this out on their own, right? But sometimes it's a good thing. The way you get inject cards is if you roll a 1 or a 20, and these are natural 1, natural 20, it's not with your modifiers, you get an inject card. Or if you roll, if you fail a roll three times, so turn 1, you fail, turn 2, you fail, turn 3, you fail, I pull an inject card. So that is the game. And I know that was a lot of rules to go through pretty quickly. I'm going to lead you through this stuff. Any questions so far? Because that was a lot of me talking question so far no, no. good 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 all right if you if you're not really into rules are we allowed to break them i will definitely entertain the idea of breaking the rule uh if you have a very interesting rule to break as we go through the game um because yeah agreed uh games aren't played fair when you're dealing with uh security you know we're, we're always as defenders limited by the the regulations and laws and contracts that attackers don't care about. So if you got a good idea, uh, we'll entertain it and see. And maybe I'll say yes. Um, we're going to go over to play out backdoors and breaches. And I think this addresses uh, one of the, the questions here, which is at play.backdoorsandbreaches.com, you can actually load a virtual edition. Excuse me, as many of you who are part of pre-show banter heard, my coffee machine broke right before a three-hour webcast, which is terrible, terrible news. <laughs> Um, so there's a number of different card games that you can choose from here. Uh, Core V2 2 is what we're going to be playing with today. But these are all versions that have been developed uh, either in-house at Black Hills Information Security or in partnership with other companies like Huntress. Uh, and then also down here we have our cloud expansion deck and we have a, a deck that we worked with Dragos uh, for IT and operational technology. So if those are your areas... Uh, there are specialized card decks for you. But we're going to play with the core deck today. And uh, you can go here, and I would highly recommend for any of you panelists or the folks at home, go to play.backdoorsandbreaches.com and then click on Core V22. Because what it's going to do, it's not going to load the game that we are playing. That I will have shared on the screen. But if you want to pull up one of the procedure cards to read it in more detail, uh, you can do that uh, by having a separate instance up and you can pull up the card and take a look at it and read it in detail and think in the background while we're playing. So you can definitely do that. I, however, have already pulled a game up and I've configured these cards behind here to tell a story. And we can go through that and start the game and I will lead you through it. But that's that. We are at this point ready to play. Uh, is everyone else ready to play? Yeah, oh, maybe, except we get paid. Yeah, yeah, you get this. Excellent. All right, I see some cheering. Excellent. I, I like the enthusiasm. I like the... Yes! All right, let's go. So, uh, here's the thing. Just like in most incidents, right? It always comes in. It's a phone call. It's at 4.30 or is it 16.30 local time, right? 
and you're ready to go home and you get a phone call. And that's how this game starts as well. So all of you are working on the same, quote, incident response team. I know you're all separate folks, but for the purposes of this. And you get a phone call. You say, hey, uh, we're getting some really weird logs from the web server. And we're not sure what it is, but it, it actually, some of the security tools are going off as well. We think we have either someone you know behaving badly, but we're not 100% certain. We're, we're engaged with the other IT teams, and we need to figure out, is this an incident? And if so, uh, we need to hand it off to you. So that's all you know right now, is that a web server is demonstrating some strange logs that caused your network operations center uh, to contact the security operations center, which said, hey, let's get the incident response team involved because this does seem a little weird. So they're giving you additional detail. It is a web server. They give you the web server information. So if you need to go hunt it down and look at logs. But that's all you know. So my question to you, turn one, is looking at the procedures, what, uh, what might you try first? And feel free to talk it through. Is it possible to zoom? Screen to the... Yeah, mm -hmm. zoom the full screen so it's better to read the procedures. Yeah. Oh, yeah, um, if you could bring... Yeah, 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 better. Yeah, and I would suggest as well, uh, if you go to, let me put in here, play.backdoorsandbreaches.com and just load a game and, you, and just click on version 2.2, um, version two, two, that way you can, on a separate window, actually click on the procedures and pull them up. But if you'd like me to pull up any procedure, I will open it up so you can take a look at it. Better. Thank you, Ryan. I was just typing that in. You could open up already sim log analysis, I think, the first one, if everybody agrees. I think yeah. so. Okay. Sim log analysis. So um, you want to go into the sim and actually start taking a look around for that that web server. All right. Everyone agree with that? Sure thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah good choice. Yeah. Hmm? Okay. Yeah. I, I think that's a great move. I mean, if you've got a sim and you're actually putting logs in there, why wouldn't you go there? for? I'm actually kind of stunned sometimes that people don't do that. So let me pull this up here. I'll make it a little bigger there for you. Um, so there's there's your procedure, right? Um, one of the things that's cool about this game is you play it with people at your conferences or you just play it with your teams is not only does the card tell you kind of what it is, but you know security information and event management, log analysis, but it also tells you some of the tools that you can use if you do not have like a Splunk or a Logrhythm or Exabeam or any of those other tools, there are some open source options that you can use. So. Uh, Kaseo, I think it was you that, that, that jumped in and said it. Do you want to be the individual to roll? Would you like me to roll on the screen for you? What would you like to do? Uh, I think you can roll. You want me to roll? Okay, very good. I'm not uh, very good. So I am, <laughs> I'm not going to roll it on there. I'm going to roll it so you all can see what I end up doing. So down here, there's this, uh, this probably needs to move over here so you can see it better. Uh, we've got our 10 turns remaining and we are using seam, which is one of our plus three. So I'm going to hit this roll dice plus three and very good. You didn't even need the plus three. You got a 12 plus three and you got more good news, right? You already knew there was a web server. And that web server was being logged into your seam, which is always the one I go to when it fails, right? If it fails, you always want to go, e yeah, it failed because uh, we didn't put the logs there. I mean, it's to show me a seam that's got all the logs and, and I will question not only my sanity, but yours. Uh, so uh, here's the good news. It actually revealed something for you. So you revealed the initial compromise, which is exactly what folks feared, right? So it was a web server compromise. The attackers are targeting a vulnerable web server. They were able to go to it and find vulnerabilities that are specifically allowing them to bypass the front end and get into your database, right? So that's why they were seeing weird logs. The logs that they would expect the web front end to pull data from either the middleware or from you know the database in a way that is very well defined and well prescribed. Instead, they're getting queries that aren't being run as store procedures that aren't being run in the way the application generally runs it. And now you realize, yes, you've got a problem. 
and you need to go into it. So well done. Very easy first one there. You know what the, the initial compromise is. Now knowing what I told you, team, why don't we pull the whole team up here again? What might be something you try next? And, and by the way, if there isn't a procedure for it, if there isn't, oh, perfect. I like that view, Ryan, uh, with them down at the bottom. That's sort of the thing's bigger. Um, if there isn't a procedure for it, just tell me what you would do, and I'll steer you towards a procedure. Because this game should be played a little bit loose so that you can work. Oh, not everyone fits. Okay. Um, it should be played a little loose. So don't go, oh, well, that procedure doesn't exist, so you can't use it. I might say, well, it's pretty close to this, so we'll try that. So what might y'all do now? You know the web server's broken. You know that's how they're getting in. And you got nine turns to figure it out. What do you got out there, John? John's playing too. What do you got there? Isolation. Isolation. So we pull up isolation for the folks here. Uh, network team is on their game. They can easily isolate infected systems to prevent further harm. So I actually like to add one additional thing in when I'm running games with this. Um, isolation, people might say, well, wait a minute. Janelle, you just reminded me I have an arrow press and I will be using it when I go downstairs. It's up in the cabinet. Um, the uh, uh, isolation. <laughs> I'm obsessed with coffee in my brain right now. Uh, so isolation is generally a reactive maneuver, right? You say, oh, something happened. Let me isolate it. How is it going to discover anything? So I generally add into this, imagine your isolation is also a sandbox that whatever the malware is doing, whatever the threat actor is doing, they're trying to phone home, you're going to see it. It's going to you know, splatter against the wall and you're going to say, okay, we've captured that and to give you more information. So that's the way I generally describe the isolation card for this gameplay. Um, does everyone agree with John? Do, do they like isolation? Maybe not. Maybe not. What do you think? Maybe not. I, I'd like to get the feeling for what's going on at the moment before I start messing with with, with the system. Okay. What what might life, uh, life what, what might you look at? Well, it depends on the environment, but uh, either the uh, look at network uh, traffic from this host, if I have that insight, or. Uh, log into those see what's going on okay so those two sound a lot like network threat hunting so from a network perspective we could see what it's communicating with and then the other one we could look at is you mentioned logging into the host we have our endpoint security protection analysis which i always simplify that is that's your edr tools you, you know, your antivirus, your local host firewalls, your isolation, your remote access to it, uh, and, and you know, in some cases, behavioral analytics. So that would be that card. So we've, we've heard isolation, endpoint security protection analysis, and network. I like where you're going. Uh, John's going very pro, at, or going, let's, let's isolate the problem. I like where you're going, Life, with, uh, with hey, we don't even know what the problem is. So let's let's figure out a little bit more. I'd go look at the E bit of the UEBA. See if there's okay. anything cool in there that's pulling stuff together as well. Okay. So user entity behavior analytics. Look yeah, at what the so server so. generally does and is this normal? Uh, really great example of that would be, hey, they're making really weird database queries and it happens every single month at the same time. Well, that sounds a lot like it could potentially be uh, a financial script or some sort of end of month script that runs to get data or analytics. Doesn't mean it is, but that's certainly it. So I like that. So Sam got user entity behavior. So we got lots of options here. What are we? What are we feeling? I'm with Sam. I'm with Sam. All right. Before before the other steps, I would say. We got two for UEBA. Okay. Any other votes? If you got the, no, I, I got agree the as well. Ability, go for it. Okay, so we're gonna try. I like UEBA, and I like it in this scenario as well because you've got a plus three modifier on it. You don't know much yet, and if you have it available, yeah, why wouldn't you look at it? Um, if you're tuned right, uh, you might get some valuable information. Okay, who wants to roll? Do you want me to roll, or does somebody else want to roll? You gave us lucky. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, you did that last time. Okay, so we're going to do the same roll again up, here. 
Uh, you know what? I almost forgot. I almost forgot one of the rules of gameplay here. Hold on. I got to move uh, our sim. Remember, is in a cooldown period. So we can't use that again. Uh, we will go through and we'll roll. Roll dice plus three. Uh, failure. Okay. So I'm glad we failed, though, because it allows us to explain a little bit more about the game's value. So user entity behavior analytics. Uh, why? Let me ask the team here. You've got it deployed. Why might it fail to detect something like that? Give me an example of why UEBA might fail. It's a bunch of reasons. Magic. Well, yeah, there's a bunch of reasons. Absolutely. What was the other one? It's black box magic. It is black box magic. That's true. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons that I like to give for this is that the behavior hasn't been classified. It hasn't. It either hasn't happened long enough, or, or actually, forgive me. It happens enough that it hasn't raised any alarms before, so it just didn't didn't see it as anything worth logging. Uh, but the other reason that I think is probably more um, relevant here is UEBA might not go through and see this as unusual. It might go, well, wait a minute. Yeah, this isn't, I mean, it's talking to the database. It does that all the time. That isn't normal. And it could be a rules tuning issue in your entity behavior analysis. Say, no, don't just look at the connections. Look at how they're connecting. And then the tool might go, oh, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll pay attention to that in the future. Um, so there's plenty of good reasons why that could fail. I like Sam saying, so there are lots of reasons. Um, I mean, at least it's not uh, uh, DLP, because I think DLP fails more often than it actually works. But Actually, to detect the anomal anomalous behavior, you need to know the normal behavior. <laughs> oh, great point. That's yeah. Point, yeah. Is, is your sample set big enough to determine what normal is? Yeah. Maybe Does not. it show you what normal is as well? Because if you've just got it going, I don't know, these things are bad, do you even trust what it's saying? It's right. Sort of a, like, this is not an yeah. extreme sales week, but, you know. Yeah. Be. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, if it, it and there, there, we didn't even touch, I mean, do you trust it? But what if it's the other way? It just goes off all the time. You know, it's like, this is all weird. Uh, okay, I can't sort through all those logs. Like, how am I Or, gonna... or if someone is running a penetration test at the exact same time. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is an inject card in here. Uh, it's the only card that ends the game. And if you get an inject, oh really? Okay, yeah, that's it's, awesome. Uh, yeah, it's it was a it was a penetration test. Um, yeah. So uh, okay. So turn two. Uh, we got our first strike there. Uh, so if we roll two more strikes, we would get an inject card. Uh, but we're gonna move this along here. So we're gonna move this over to UEBA. So that is unavailable. Uh, Sim comes back in two turns. We have uh, eight turns left to go through and figure out the next three. So we had a couple that were there that, that folks liked. John liked isolation. Um, what was the other one that was pulled? The user uh, end user security behavior. Oh, no, that's the wrong one. I'm sorry. Endpoint security protection analysis. Did we want to go back and take a look at those? Or is opinion I changing? Have, I have a question. Yeah. So, so how does uh, isolating the web server help us figure out uh, if there was any pivot or not? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's kind of what I was going into before is isolation on its own wouldn't. You're absolutely right. Uh, it's not going to tell us anything. It's just going to stick us in there. So generally what I tell folks is when we isolate the server, imagine this isolation technology is also a sandboxing technology. And while it's isolated, uh, you're heavily monitoring the network traffic, registry hives, if it's um, if it's Windows, uh, you know, writes to, to different areas inside of, the, especially if it's virtualized and you can you can do that, um, things like that. So imagine it's a sandboxing technology that, when isolated, uh, now you can you know get a better idea of what the attacker's doing. But we still don't know whether it's bad or not. So and we are going to. Um... Uh, obviously ruin something which is in production and we don't even know if there's a problem. Uh, I, well, one, you, at this point you do know it's a problem because you were able to look at the web server and you identified that, that it is compromised and that isn't necessarily ah, sure. the yeah. problem. The UEBA didn't tell you exactly why uh, or exactly what they were doing, but you knew those logs or you've identified 
that is not right. That is not a business process. Now, um, and, and forgive me, yeah, so you, you have identified that, but I love the point that you brought up about isolation because I do this on my tabletops. They say, oh, we're going to isolate. And I say, okay, what business operations is that going to impact? And everyone goes, uh, okay. Do you have a plan to notify people when you have to make the problem bigger to solve it? Uh, and that's generally a fine thing. <laughs> Putting the cable out the back of the mail server. Like, that's right. That's right. Every, every, yeah, in olden days. Every, it didn't matter what it was. Someone's running at the mail server and trying to rip the cable out. Like, Is it even an yeah. email, like, email board? No. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Could you, could you open this uh, ser uh, server analysis, I think? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can have yeah, yeah, yeah. for you. Yeah, so server analysis, the ability to baseline a system. So the way that we generally treat this card is you can go to the system and say, wait a minute, uh, what is the system generally doing? How is it configured? And do we see anything different about it? And the example they give in here is you go and you look at it, you say there should be nothing running as a scheduled task in tax, task manager, and you find evil underscore backdoor.exe. Hopefully the attacker wouldn't name it something like that, but frankly, we've all seen dumber things. Um, but you find a, a task in there that kicks off whenever it, it runs, whenever the computer starts up, that starts this backdoor. So that's that's what the server analysis one is. And then we also saw a question here about the network threat hunting. So network threat hunting, we make a tool called uh, Rita, but you can use any threat hunting tool uh, to go through and actually analyze traffic on your network looking for... Uh, the TTPs, techniques, uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures that threat actors might use to identify bad behavior. So those are definitely options available to you. What are we thinking? What What do we like? What do we not like? I I would go for server analysis since we know it's a web server. We have the scene logs and so on. Or the object of the attack is the server itself. I would look for it before networking or something. Like this. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that, uh, that sounds like something I would do. Okay. I'm hearing a lot of consensus on uh, on on server analysis. Okay. All right. Uh, you want me to roll again, or because I I'm one for one, one and one right now. I'll roll again if you'd like, or somebody else can. I just rolled a twenty here. Did you really? <laughs> I'll believe you if you said so. I. Well, wait, wait, hold on. Was that Lars? I do not believe Lars. Lars is, no, is, it wasn't me. It that, was someone else. <laughs> <laughs> and keep in mind, though, when you roll a twenty, that's one. That's an inject as well. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. Ahead. I mi I misread. I misread. No, I yeah. think you should roll. Um, I should roll. Probably. Okay. All right. Very good. Well, we've got a physical dice here. We yeah, can roll. Yeah, we we got plenty. Oh, you got one. Oh, oh you, John, you roll. John, you roll. Then. Let's get all of these other dice off the table so we don't mix them up. Yeah, that would be bad. Seven. Seven. All right. So we were using server analysis. We rolled a seven, so that didn't work, right? That didn't. So um, what? you went to the server, and you went to take a look at it, and there was actually nothing on the server beyond the fact that you know this, this individual is able to go through and compromise. Uh, not compromise. Forgive me. That's the wrong word to use. Uh, you went and looked at the server. The configurations are all the way they're supposed to be, which is really a lot of what comes on. There's no additional software installed on this web server. There's no uh, changes to the configuration of the, of the web server. The server is built as designed and all the switches flipped properly. So what I would take from that, by the way, is that it's not the server, it's the application running on the server but maybe I'm just being nice. Maybe I'm trying to lead you down the wrong path. I don't know. Take it how you will. But unfortunately, it didn't work. So you, you're no further along in learning what's going on. Uh, we're going to move these around. So now we have uh, our server analysis at three, this at two, and our seam comes back after the next turn. So two failures in a row. <laughs> which means we're we're very close to inject land. Um, oh, and actually, I need to go through and uh, um, remove a turn. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Uh, because you rolled manually, so I have to remove a turn. All right. Um, do we want to go back to some of the other pieces? What would you do in this scenario? You're in an incident response. You went and looked at the server. It seems normal. You do know that you're seeing logs 
for the, the web application connecting to the databases in ways that it possibly shouldn't? Crisis management. Wow, we're bad. Go straight. Crisis <laughs> management. Are we memory memory analysis? analysis? <laughs> I get a lot of problem. Yeah. Um, I like memory analysis. I think as well. Memory analysis or network analysis? I'm sorry. Memory. Yeah. Memory. I'm this okay. Why, why are you thinking memory analysis? I want to see what's actually going on in that box a bit more. As opposed okay. To, is anyone got anything else? Yeah. Okay. So you, you're, that you're seems, that seems so like a lot there's, of work. there's definitely a problem yeah, with yeah. the camera because my blinds are closed now and it keeps it keeps doing the. Pivot. I would I would do the network analysis. Okay. Because if there is a pivot, there's usually movement as well. Yeah. True. Yeah. Okay. So we got memory analysis and and network. So show of hands. You wipe my network. Network. <laughs> Network. Show hands for network. network. Oh, Sam's changed her mind. Okay, she threw her. Okay. okay. So we're going to try network analysis. Um, we're going to take a look at the traffic, right? Potentially from the outside to the web server, web server to the database server. What is actually going on? So uh, again, uh, we can we can go back to John with the with the dice and John and Klaus. I can roll. What what do we want to try here? Be more successful, please. Yeah, <laughs> What's that? We think. We think Lars should roll. Lars should. <laughs> now that now that he knows not to say twenty, right? <laughs> I'm all in on blue Lego. Yes, I'm upping. I'm upping my game here. I was waiting. Yeah, I was waiting for him to just like drop a Lego on there so you get the sound and be like, ah. Oh, uh... oh, we could do that. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any Legos available? You could do that. No. Yeah, there might be some. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> All right, who's who's rolling? Who's rolling? Let's have Lars do it. All right. I think it... Lars, they've nominated you. I'll, what did I'll... you roll? But I don't have any. I don't have it. I can cheat and I can drop the Legos. <laughs> All right, John, I'll roll. roll. John, roll. <laughs> he just trash, John. I didn't get... roll. It Klaus was gonna roll. Oh, yeah, oh Klaus was gonna roll. Yeah, that was a. Showing him how to roll. That roll was in metric. We need it in freedom units. Oh yeah. Sixteen. Sixteen. 16. Yeah. All right. Very good. So a sixteen. So I have to tell you now one of the meta rules of this game. It's not one that's official, but I'm gonna mention it because uh, I'm a nice guy. Um, so if you are successful running a procedure that would reveal two cards. I am only going to show you one card. Now, generally, I would say do with that what you will. I say this mostly for the audience. Um, because if you're ever playing this game and uh, a procedure would reveal two cards, uh, just know that it means that you probably need to go back. Some, some incident masters will tell you what I just told you. Others won't. And you can take it how you will. Uh, but the thing is, I mentioned that only really for the audience because, yes, you did discover something. You discovered the C2 and XFIL using network, which is not surprising, right? You did some network threat hunting, and oh my gosh, what did we find? We found HTTPS as XFIL, which pretty common, right? Uh, it used to be it's like, oh, we got to do this over DNS, we got to do this over whatever, and then and then uh, in in the truest of bounties. Let's Encrypt, uh, which is a great thing. I think it's awesome. I think it's wonderful. It's also used by a lot of criminals to make sure that they can have legitimate uh, certificates that can't be inspected. So if you don't have a proxy in place to, to break that, um, well, uh, we can... Oh, that's fine. If you can read my doc text, Godspeed. Um, but thank you. thank you for letting me know, Ryan. Um, I didn't share the... Uh, the uh, the screen there, and I'm sorry, the application instead of the window. I generally share the whole screen in case I want to pull stuff over. Anyway, back to regular programming. Um, HTTPS, yeah, that's how they were exfilling data. So you know they're getting in to the web server, and you know that they are getting data out at this point, which is kind of the worst thing in the world. You know the the entrances and the exits, but you you haven't stopped them yet. So well done. You were successful in getting that. Now, notice here, network threat hunting and network threat hunting. Yeah, so if you hadn't already discovered the web server compromise, 
when I play, I would tell you I'm only going to reveal one card. You might want to go back to this because I, you know, sometimes teams will not realize that that hey, I found this and this would discover everything. It's not a rule that's written into the game, but I, I think it's much more effective. So cool. We are moving on here. I got to remove a turn because John rolled. So we have got six turns remaining. And now we have to move our doo -doo -doo, here. We go three, two, one. Your seam is back online. And for the sake of time and for gameplay, because a lot of people are learning here, you can take that same rule that I said before. And I can tell you right now, seam is not going to show you anything else in this game. So even though you got your seam back, the only thing it was going to reveal was your web server compromise. Now, I'm being a very nice uh, incident master right now, but it's because I know some of you are new to this game and many are watching uh, just learning about it. So I want you to kind of understand the gameplay mechanics as well. So uh, we we got six turns remaining. Your seam's back, but I told you it's worthless. It's not going to find anything new. Um, what might we try next? Endpoint analysis. Endpoint analysis. All right, let's pull up endpoint analysis. So there are two cards for endpoint analysis. I'd like to explain uh, the difference between the two. So endpoint security protection analysis, uh, like I mentioned, that's more like your EDRs, uh, yeah, right? So that's remotely connecting to it. That's it gathering data through like a client, etc. Endpoint analysis is physically going to the computer. Now, some, when I say physically, I mean the computer understanding you is at the keyboard. Maybe not necessarily physically next to it, but using a tool that recognizes you as, as on console. And actually going to it and looking at the logs, digging through the system, it's, it's akin to server analysis, but at the endpoint. So uh, when your EDR fails, you generally go to that system and actually start digging around manually. That's what this card is. Yeah, so I would change then for fire log review. See, so we have two things related to network threat hunting and threat analysis. Like, okay. Okay, firewall log review. So what do you think? pretty straightforward there. You go and look at the firewall logs and see if you can determine anything else. What, is, what does everyone else think? Thoughts ever I you the audience can't see you off screen, but I love I love at this point in the game where everyone's like, oh man, now I gotta think. What do we want? <laughs> Talk again, life. <laughs> oh, I guess we were muted. Audio, sorry. Oh yeah. Uh, the the big quest the big question for me is who else is talking to that C two in my organization? Mm. Okay. So you wanna you would go back and say now let's go back, and th I think that is corroborated by what Cassio said is firewall log reviews. Now that I have a destination, let me go back and search the firewalls for who's actually gone outbound. So this is assuming, of course, that you've got an outbound firewall or a proxy or something like that that you can go to review. So I, I think that's a great idea. What does everyone else think? Seeing some nods, seeing some still thinking. Yeah, I'm thinking which of the two cards are we trying to flip? Uh, pivot and escalate. Pivot and escalate and persistence. So once they're in, how are they yeah, moving about yeah. the network? And then how... Yeah, I get it. But oh. which one Which one is the, the priority at this point in time? I l oh, that's such a good question. Um, in this game, we don't have a concept of priority. But you're absolutely right. In real life, you wouldn't just go through and try and solve the whole scenario. You would try and minimize impact as well. Um, I would say probably, if I were to assign a priority to this, I would probably say pivot and escalate. Because if you can stop them from moving around, now you just have to find where they're persistent and get rid of them. So I would probably go the other way, whereas if you get rid of their persistence, but they can still reestablish themselves, uh, it's it's almost like hunting insects, right? You have to you have to you have to you have to stop the the eggs of the uh, eggs or live birth. And this is getting weird. Um, yeah, but sure, sure. In, but in a true scenario, you would at yeah. this point in time, you would probably shut down the web server. So, and if that is the entry point, it doesn't matter if they can still pivot and escalate if unless they can hit a similar one. Well, so I would, I would, I would get rid of them 
at that point. Yeah, but that's what the persistence is, right? You have to assume yeah. in this particular scenario they've yeah. already established persistence. So just shutting down the web server doesn't kick them out of the environment. They've they've put in their own backdoors, whether that be you know SSH mm -hmm. keys, whether that be malware, whether it be application shimming, whatever it may be. So um, you have to assume that just getting rid of that. And, and, and also, okay, uh, we shut down the web server. Is that the right thing to do operationally? Can we shut down just one web server in a, in a pod? Or does that take the whole service offline? And again, it's just questions I'm asking. Um, Fido's log review. Okay, so we got Sam still wants to look at the box. We got a private chat going here, so still wants to get yeah. onto the box. Um, and we've got firewall log review. I think those are the, kind of the two directions we're going here. So who says firewall log review? And one, two. I'm going to both. <laughs> I'm going to both. I'm going to both. So we've only got two hands up for firewall log review. What about uh, endpoint? Going to endpoint. Hand up. That. One, two. Three. Okay, so that was the tiebreaker over there, Lars. So we got three. Uh, are we doing endpoint security analysis where we're using the EDR, or are we using? Are we actually going to the box? Which would you like to do? To the box. To the box. Yeah. To EDR the box. is a great product, but I'm not biased at all. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't just launched a commercial product around and. <laughs> no, I mean to be fair, all of these are great tools, and I think we talked about this early on. Um, just depends on how you implement it, how you manage it, right? It's a t it's a it's a tool to be used. I think was the the quote around a GDPR. One of you said it's a, it's a tool to be as Klaus Klaus said it. Um, so cool endpoint analysis. Who's rolling this time? Are we going back to John to roll again? Would you like me to roll? Klaus can roll. He yeah, rolled I'm, a yeah, I'm better. Klaus, all right. Klaus, Klaus can roll. Eleven. Yeah, yeah I am. Eleven. Yeah. Very good. All right. So we were rolling against endpoint analysis, and let me look over on my notes here. Uh, da, 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 da. We we're trying to reveal those too. Interesting. Uh, so this actually is a time where that meta rule would come into place. Uh, so I'm only going to show you one. Um, so you discovered the pivot and escalate. They were using local privilege. Escalation. So once they got onto the box, they were able to escalate their privileges using local privilege escalation. Now, they did not do this in this particular scenario with a vulnerability uh, on, uh, on the server necessarily. That's why you didn't see anything there. They did it in the application. So essentially what they were able to do is use the web application, one of the, the application accounts. Uh, they were able to compromise that and use that to escalate their privileges within the app, which is what also allowed them uh, to start running those database queries that are unusual because now they were running it in that application's context. And that's why also your UEBA didn't necessarily see anything wrong because they're like, this application makes database queries. Well, okay, big deal. I mean, they're larger now, but you didn't tell me to look for that. So, okay. So good, good job. You got your local privilege escalation and, um, let me go ahead and remove a turn here because we're down five turns here. Now let me go back to here, and I always have trouble doing this, so uh, we'll go here, here, and here. There we go. So you got UEBA back, but if you are a fan of metagaming, UEBA, uh, you you failed. No, you failed before. Forgive me. Um, that roll failed. Uh, so disregard what I just said. You have five turns left. You have one thing to reveal. You have to reveal persistence. What a... Oh, boy. There, I just saw the business. Memory development. analysis now. Which one? Memory analysis. Memory analysis. Yeah. So you want to go actually look at the server, see if there's anything running mm -hmm. in memory uh, to see if there are any challenges. Does everyone agree with that? Mm, a lot of quiet. Silence means yes. <laughs> well, if we have someone in the team that's very happy to do it. Okay. Uh, I'm not hearing a lot of confidence in memory analysis. 
What else do we have left? Can you show the... I absolutely can. So your seam is back, but as I mentioned to you, that's not really going to help you. Memory analysis is what's on the table. You have isolation. You could isolate the system and put it also into a sandbox. For the sake of time, I'm going to tell you to avoid that. Um, and then uh, uh, also you've got crisis management. You've got endpoint security protection analysis Cyber deception, which we haven't talked about yet. This is deploying a honeypot or some other token mm -hmm. on there in the hopes that the attacker will bite onto that and give you more information about who they are and what they're doing. And then, of course, uh, firewall log review. We didn't use firewall log review. We went with the endpoint. Um, the honeypot could be a good option, too. Okay. And actually, forgive me, um, I told you not to use that. So Honeypot could be good. You had everyone said memory analysis before. We've got Honeypot for cyber deception. Mm -hmm. What's everyone else think? I think we should uh, choose memory analysis because it's so cool. <laughs> good enough. Good enough times, all, right. all right. Hey, th you know, that's two votes for memory analysis. So I'm, I'm, I'm game. We should do it. Sure. And you got plenty of turns. So, and Ian, I want to jump in before we go there. I think we're going to do a, a short talk about underwater sea cables after the game if anybody wants to stick around for a few extra minutes. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. Um, uh, we do want to give everyone a, a chance to, you know, especially the folks who have got conferences and also this uh, AD Avalanche tool that you've got. We want to make, remind folks of that as well. So, let's do memory analysis. Who's going to roll? Klaus, the master roller. Yeah. Klaus, Klaus, you're 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 hot. We're taking you to the craps table. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. No no pressure or anything. Fifteen. Fifteen. 15. Yes, Very Klaus. good. I went fire. So um, I'd be lying if I said that I wasn't uh, kind of steering you towards memory analysis to go back to that. Because yes, that does reveal your persistence in this case. So in this particular case, they were using DLL attacks in which they were going through and either injecting into a DLL that's running or uh, or getting an application to run another DLL. But either way, that's how they were maintaining persistence. They were using dynamic link libraries that was then uh, going through and uh, launching code to reconnect them for their C2 or and allow them to get back in and run those database queries. And that's the reason I was going through and saying, you know, yeah, you can isolate the web server, but they've already pivoted throughout the environment. So we, what happened here, right? So the way this scenario was set up is it was, I, I kind of used the Equifax breach. Uh, this is obviously not exactly that, but I said, oh, what happened with the Equifax breach? So in the Equifax breach, uh, a web server was compromised. And that web server was the disputes portal. So if you deal with any sort of credit reporting and you want to go in and say, this wasn't me, I didn't buy $5,000 in dog food from, you know, Chewy.com or whatever. Um, so you say, hey, they had a web server compromised through this disputes portal. And the disputes portal had access to talk all the way back to the backend databases when it really, really shouldn't have. Um, once they compromise that, and this is where things get a little fuzzy in the card game, um, the way I explained this was local privilege escalation. So they went through, and again, using the privileges that existed in the app to do that database connection, they did the extra database connections. They then exfiltrated data out over HTTPS uh, and then uh, maintained persistence. Now, this isn't necessarily how they maintain persistence, but I wanted to have cards that were different. Uh, but DLL attacks. So they put some DLL, once they pivoted throughout the environment using some of those credentials, maybe on the database server, et cetera, they injected in uh, DLLs that would allow them to reconnect. So that's the game. That's how it's played. Um, I know we went through it kind of fast and kind of loose so that we could, you know, get through it and whatnot. What do you think of this game? Do you think this would be valuable for people to play? Uh, well, and just what do you think in general? And you can say, no, Ian, you're fat and bald, and I didn't like it, and that's totally fine, too. <laughs> yeah, my, fir my first thought, I, I see how this could be super valuable for a team mm -hmm. who has to look for threats and vulnerabilities every day, because that's the thing. Lack security is what creates data incidents. Um, so it, it, it helps prepare you to think outside the box to the point of where 
by playing this game, when an actual event happens, you're ready. At least you can say, okay, we've discussed this, this, and this. Let's try that. And it also gives you uh, best practices, and that's that's never a bad thing. It's cool. It's cool. This, I've seen it before uh, at the Wild West Hacking Fest, but mm-hmm. I, I didn't play it. So this is really cool. Yeah, awesome. Great. Any other feedback or things like that? I really liked yeah. it, and I have a massive aversion to anything that has a die with more than six sides. So, oh, wow. That, so that's not a very... Oh. I was about to say, like, that sounds like a very specific trauma that we don't have time to get into. Like, why Why do you hate <laughs> that? Separate show. Separate <laughs> show. <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. So I think, uh, I think it was really good as well. I think it, it's a conversation starter. Even if you have people that don't understand what it is we're discussing, you can you can have a, a talk and help them understand what what is this technology? How does that help you? And um, if you have people that do understand the technology, you can uh, you can have them go. Mm, why don't we have this in our organization? So I think it's um, it's valuable. I will definitely unpack mine real soon now. Oh, awesome. very good. So wonderful. So we are right at the top of the webcast. And we've been chatting for a while. Thank you so much for all of you who have turned tuned in. Uh, check this out. Hopefully uh, it inspires you to one, reach out, especially if you're in Europe, check out some of these cool conferences that these folks are putting on. Check out some of the projects uh, that, that they're doing that we had mentioned uh, during the webcast. We are going to stick around for just a couple minutes, but we know that some of you may need to drop. So before we do, again, thank you to everyone that joined. Uh, Sam, any final thought before we go into the, you know, the extended hours, any final thought you want to share either about what you're working on or anything at all? No, because I have to go so to feed humans, apparently. Um, support yeah, your yeah. local B-sizes, please. And if your vendors or people hiring, like, sponsor them, because these things run on a shoestring by people who are magicians. Um, That's right. And they just do marvelous things for the community and bring people together and help people get jobs and find out cool projects to work on. Um, and clearly I'm very biased because I work on three of them, but, um, send money, send love, come be part of it. Everyone's a participant of B-Sides. Nobody's like, like more important than anybody else. So just get, get involved. Other conferences are available that aren't called B-Sides that have a similar ethos. Um, but yeah, get involved with your local community and you won't regret it. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining. Go feed your humans. Uh, I've got humans that are coming back to you for lunch. So very good. A good one. All, right. All right, Lars. Any final thoughts? Um, yeah, in general, yes. Um, I think I think this was uh, very valuable for all of us. Um, I think um, I think uh, I don't know what I think really. I I liked it. It's this is new for me, uh, awesome. doing something online like this. Um, Awesome. Yeah. Uh, wh- what was your website again for the commercial product and also for your your we we put the uh, GitHub in the uh, in the chat. Yeah, there. I think I think the the GitHub one is good enough. You can just Google for Adlands. You will get the commercial site. I I don't mm-hmm. really want to promote that uh, as much here. But if well, any venture if, if, if any that. venture capitalists are listening in, <laughs> feel free to reach out. Um, I'll be honest with you. They generally don't like us. We don't speak very well about them. <laughs> but that's okay. But yes, but please, if you want to reach out to someone who will appreciate them, uh, Lars, uh, all those VCs that are that are listening, please. Uh, wonderful. Uh, Matthias, any final thoughts? Uh, uh, final thoughts. Uh, a lot of uh, thoughts about how B-Sites is going uh, to go tomorrow. Uh, I will add the uh, uh, yes, uh, sponsor th- things. Uh, yes, uh, register, turn up, participate, participate, give good talks, all that stuff. Uh, I, I like community building conferences. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, this won't be the last besides in India. I hope so as well. And good luck with your conference tomorrow. I'm sure it will go fantastic. Jeremiah. Final thoughts. My final thoughts, really informative. It's nice to speak with other people who speak the same language and think outside the box. Um, the game was interesting because, you know, I didn't know what to expect from that, but I, I, I really see value working with companies and teams who 
don't put enough energy and effort. You know, a lot of the C-level executives don't understand the value of cybersecurity and they don't understand, you know, they want to see ROI. What are you working on? Write me a report. You know, have we done an automated penetration test that has 50 pages of false positives or do we have a real plan? So super informative. I, I enjoyed it very much. Very good. Awesome. Uh, Caseo. Yes, guys. Thank you again for having me. Thank you for the invitation from John. For, for sure, we're going to grab a couple of beers more. Uh, game was awesome. I think the education and this kind of promotion is the one of the ways of getting people word more about cybersecurity. Because I think cybersecurity now is the same topic that we should discuss more, the same as sexuality, the same as religion, yeah. politics, you know, it's, it's the same level because mm -hmm. software basically controls our lives today. So it's, oh. it's kind of very important for us. And I used to say that security is everybody's, every, everyone is responsibility. So everyone should wear about it and know about it. And invite everybody to besides Krakow in September. So if you are in Poland or around, please come in. Wow. John, John, I'm going to crash on your couch. How about that now? <laughs> uh, all right. Very good. And last but certainly not least, Leaf. Life. Get it right. Leaf. No, nobody can pronounce it. Uh, uh, terrible uh, American uh, tongue. We don't know any. any yeah. Uh, the, the French call me Leaf. The American. The journals call me Life. And the Americans will. Yeah. Well, leave. Uh, anyway, yeah, it's it's been fun. I've seen the game before. It's the first time I played it. Uh, it was really good to have a sort of guide and walkthrough of it. Uh, so that that was valuable. Uh, I'm looking forward to have a look at the ICS uh, deck because that's oh, yeah. sort of yeah. an area I've been working in before. Wonderful. Yeah, that was with our partners at Dragos, and I know Lind, uh, Leslie Carhart was already mentioned a few times, but she's going to be one of our keynote speakers out at uh, Wild West Hackenfest, and was instrumental Ooh. in helping build, uh, helping build that deck. So the whole team out there was was fantastic. So great. Uh, awesome. at, uh, let's uh, we'll wrap up here and we'll go into extra innings. But uh, uh, feedback. Oh, sorry, well. forgive me. You're in this. I just did what Jason does to Deb. <laughs> on all the web paths. I'm like, oh, he's over there. Yeah, so, yeah, Klaus, sorry. Yeah, final thoughts. Yeah, I, I want to remind everybody of Eastside Copenhagen, November 11th. Mm -hmm. and, and and of course, tomorrow, tomorrow at, at, at Beta Zoom, I'll be doing my talk on, on living with ATAT and InfoSec. That's awesome. And uh, which, which is basically, you know, my talk, my all my um, experience with the with, with big diagnosed and you know uh, and all the bad things or and all the good things about having HDHD one of them is being better planning procrastinating all that song all the all that things that all, the, all those things that 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 everybody with those problems to know about right and um, and, and basically spreading the word and the breaking down to booth and all that stuff and I'm going to Wild West Hacking Fest hopefully and I've, I've I've started a GoFundMe campaign which I'm sure Ryan will switch to in a few seconds and please yeah, Ryan, donate that QR code again I'd love yeah, to see because that. I really, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I need luck, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not near the ten percent yet, so please scan the QR code, send with a dough, and, and and I'll be happy, and everybody else will. I hope we'll see. Yeah, make it, make it out to South Dakota. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I promise see, you, it's I, fun. I, I, get, I, I get to see parts of the U.S. that I didn't even think existed. Yeah, you know. there's a Deadwood. Deadwood is Deadwood is it's exactly what you would expect of a of a of a, of a town with that name, right? It is. It is. It's a pile of fun, too. So, awesome. Okay. Right, so, for those yeah. of you who have to drop off, um, one again, thank you to all the panelists. Thank you for everyone who tuned in. Uh, we're going to go into a bit of extra innings here. We're going to discuss one more story uh, that uh, at, at the request of the team here. So, we're going to discuss one more story, but if you have to drop off, thank you for joining us. Definitely check out more webcasts. We're hoping to do more like this. Uh, John and I were even talking about, I'd love to do a series where I come on and say, this is all the English you're going to hear. This is what we're talking about. And the rest of it is in Polish, Dutch, you know, wh whoever's speaking, so that you've got something that you can share with your people, uh, you know, locally in the native language. So I'd love to see like an international set of webcasts where I leave and go, I have no idea what was said, but it sounded amazing. Um, we're yeah, <laughs> we're yeah, yeah, we're doing that. So wonderful. Thank you for joining. Make sure to join our Discord, and uh, let's go an extra. So, so underwater sea cables for those who can hang out for a few more minutes. John, 
Well, yeah, and just to answer that one question there, um, I, I don't think Visa to me is being streamed, right? No. Nope. Uh, yeah. No. And then, well, is there any no. recording that will be posted post? Or? Uh, well, not well. well that, I think that that's alphabetized. Yeah, but, but yeah. I don't uh, think we we do not have any plans to record it. Uh, if uh, some of the speakers uh, shout at me loudly, we'll try to have uh, something. But I've not gotten such a request yet. Fair enough. No. Well, well, I, I, I have equipment, so we can, we, 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 oh, can, yeah. we, can, we, can we can do something both, tomorrow. Yeah. We, we can talk about that. But, but also, in terms of my talk, I, I did, I did a similar talk at Besides Dublin a few weeks ago, and that was recorded professionally, and the recording will be released soon, and that went well. So, awesome. If not, if if, if everything else fails, so go watch that if you want to see my talk. Yeah, uh, or or come up to Umeå tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, or, yeah, or do the that. Registration is between nine and ten local time. Awesome. No problem. All right. So undersea cables. Undersea cables. Um, so let's talk about the undersea cables. Um, there is a lot going on that I'm reading about in the news. Um, you know, we've had a pipeline at one point that was blown up. Yeah, There's Green. just we're seeing a lot of uh, we're seeing whales that are swimming around collecting that. I mean, there's just so much going on. I want to hear from the local folks around the Baltic, um, in the North Sea, what is going on? What is going on <laughs> to, to, from your perspective? Yeah, well, well, the, there was this podcast released a few, uh, well, a few months ago, I think, done done together with uh, the journalists from Denmark, Norway and Sweden did that together. It's called Cold Cold Front. Yeah, I, I think it, in, in, the, in the international no, version. And, and, they, and basically they were, they found some, British guy who was able to track a, a Russian ghost ships as, 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 as it was traveling through um, um, the North Sea, I guess, of, uh, looking at various uh, uh, present and and future uh, in, uh, windmill farms, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so 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 basically, that there's a lot of things going on, and, and inherently, it's impossible to protect that that much or that big area, that big an area. And, and I mean, one thing is. It's all it's all it's that and also the undersea cables that goes from between the U.S. and Europe that go through Denmark, and that there there has been some some talk about about how they were, how 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 NSA was working with the Danish military intelligence to 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 tap on these cables and all that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of concerns in in a lot of directions, definitely. So, yep. you know, I heard John say about the the Baltic. Oh, go ahead, forgive me. No, no, fine. But um, I'd like to elaborate a bit uh, on what Klaus said because it's um, I saw the documentary, uh, not not the podcast, and it's um, it's true. It's a it's a Scandinavian uh, documentary series um, where, where journalists dig into um, foreign military operations uh, being conducted on yeah, hybrid war uh, in, on, on infrastructure, and it's uh, it's called the Shadow War. Um, and and the, the the frightening thing is that we we had the the Nord Stream uh, gas pipe uh, sabotage happen, and nobody really knows what happened. And uh, they were actually able to discover um, and track ships which had, uh, as Klaus said, uh, shadow ships with their uh, beacons turned off, and and uh, map their routes uh, uh, for quite a while. Uh, based on, I'm not sure, I think satellite photos and a combination of things. So they have this huge database on all ships traffic for the last five years or so. And and um, they had a few vessels that popped up um, several times in, in, in the wrong places. So going to uh, the northern part of, uh, of uh, England and, and staying stationary for several days new, uh, near uh, large windmill farms. Um, and they weren't sure what they were doing, but these are ships that are capable of uh, having submersibles on board, which can which can be deployed without anyone seeing uh, from from ports below uh, the water level. So you have you have this, uh, you have um, transformer substations uh, which collect all the power and send it to to land, and no one has a clue whether they were just looking or if they actually planted something that can be used later on. 
no one has looked and uh, and also also in regards to the to the sabotage on on the gas pipe this is this is just the beginning really i think um it's a huge worry so so it's i don't know if do you know klaus is this available in english uh, the co the cold front podcast is okay cool then then definitely you should listen in and with the war in ukraine you it's it gets more and more uh, relevant but yeah. you know one thing i'll add if you look at the way russia has strategically targeted infrastructure with a smaller neighboring country they'll absolutely do the same if if they ever have a conflict with nato that's the first thing they're going to do is attack uh, the information infrastructure. What my concern would be, the most vulnerable part, as I understand it, of these underwater cables is where they reach land. Now think about the systems or the remote systems and the networking of that information. What sort of security are they offering? You know, because you look at like IoT, for example, when an IoT device is created, it's not designed with an operating system that 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 is ready to have security updates on a regular basis. So that's a, a huge worry that's not just destroying the cables. And I, I read that they only have like a 25 or 30 year lifespan. So they're constantly, you know, having to either update or maintain maintain them. If you look at the 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 water pressure, the salt water, all of the, you know, the issues that the cables themselves face. And I, I was never able to really get a clear answer on whether, uh, like he was saying with these submersibles or a submarine, I wonder if they can extract data or, or capture it as it's traveling through those cables. So that's just some things to think about, but it's a huge risk because we're not on Starlink yet. We're not on full satellite. I, I think I forget what percentage, but it's it's you know high nineties percentage of data between Europe and the United States and around the world travels through these underground cables. So it's a huge risk, and and we depend on the internet for banking, for communication, for business, for everything. Um, so that that is critical infrastructure that will absolutely be targeted as soon as there is a global conflict. And the redundancies are being targeted as well in space. Yeah. 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 One thing, one thing is information, which is critical, of course, uh, but power is uh, even more relevant because no power, no information, no, whether you have the fiber cables in the sea or not. Uh, and uh, the entire, and the entire power grid is like a balancing act with, with a knife. Um, or or a pen uh, at the end of your finger, and it, if it topples, <laughs> you have trouble. And and it doesn't take that much um, actually to to uh, cause havoc if you if you remove power and add power. Uh, so maybe a distributed system like all the all the um, the windmill farms, if you can control maybe ten of them, and you can toggle them quickly, what happens? And I'm not answering that. But well, it's, well, probably, not, actually, but it's let, probably not good. Yeah, I, there's there's an amazing book. Uh, I think it's two seconds after where the U.S. gets attacked by EMP weapons and powers out, and it it you know it takes years to get all that back up and running. And uh, what it does to society is. Is horrible. Um, but uh, going back to the data, what happens if? What are the scenarios that we have here for for the data cables, right? So they could cut a cable, or they could try to pull data from the, you know, from it. What happens if they just cut the cable? You know, what's what what happens? Depends on if they cut enough of them. I I think there's like 420 cables globally. Yeah. Uh, there's probably about uh, two, three dozen uh, across the Atlantic that have mm -hmm. relevant sizes. Uh, Leif, do you have a better view on that? 
yeah, something of that order. I mean, that's the beauty of, you know, how the internet's set up is that traffic will just reroute itself, right? And, and, and go a different way, but I mean, it's not, it won't work. Let's say they cut, let me rephrase my question. Let's say that they cut one third of the cables. What would that do to the internet in Europe and America if one third of the undersea backbone cables were cut? Well, if you think about just the, the, the economic value of all of the global trade, all of the purchases that travel from Europe to America, to Canada in a single day, it, it's massive. So if you look at the economic hit, that's that's huge. Um, and, and, you know, because there is no single body that owns and operates these cables, you know, they're they're owned and operated by, you know, major corporations. So ideally in this case competition would be good if you have multiple cables but just like he was saying earlier the fact that you know all these ghost ships have been following them and mapping them um i think in the event of a global conflict that's the first thing they'll target you know they'll break them of course they can be fixed but what if that area where it's broken is not safe you know what if you you know, you, you're, you're going to face a conflict situation when you go and try to, to repair it. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a huge what if scenario that would affect us all in ways that we can't even imagine. You know, right now, life is comfortable. Life is, you know, we think about, oh, no, my Internet's down. You know, I, I need to call this person. I need to reset the router. You have this very strict set of, of steps that you would take if you lack information in this case information's gone you know what what do you do at that point so it really is a doomsday scenario to you know if these cables were, were truly attacked in a way that they couldn't be repaired for months or years i mean if we, we, do, uh, we do suffer partial internet outages now and then uh, the other week it, we a, a pretty good simulation was when we lost uh, AWS One East, one of Amazon's big data centers, which brought down a pretty large chunk of internet services with it. And I mean, that was a lot of trouble. It uh, cost a lot of money, but I mean, civilization didn't fail. Life goes on. Yeah, I, I think I'm I'm not I'm not that worried about all the, the data cables really because it's a question of bandwidth uh, until you hit something which is not redundant anymore. So you, we can switch off uh, YouTube. It would be an act of war uh, if it happens. But uh, it has happened, uh, and that's part of the investigation. I, uh, Klaus and me uh, talked about uh, earlier. There was an incident uh, at Svalbard, I think. Uh, where they could see that someone had trawled um, uh, the seabed to to cut the cable. Mm -hmm. It was the cable was crossed many many times until they finally caught it because it's in a ditch. So they kept doing it back and forth, back and forth until the cable was torn. So that was a test, definitely. But um, but still, power is drives everything. No power, it's a problem. Energy is uh, scary. That's the, I mean, that, that's where people die. It's true. Yeah. So decentralization, if 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 that was possible, that would, that would be really great. But it, that's not where we are, right now. Everything is connected. So what that's about gloomy? What, <laughs> one uh, um, FSXX nine five four two. Uh, asked about the siphoning or, you know, pulling the data. We talked about just cutting data or power. What happens? I mean, what if there are, is data, if data is being siphoned from these cables, is that possible technically? I think that depends on which organization, which in the U.S., which three-letter organization you ask and when. Uh, I think there's a number of reports that it is not only possible, but it is feasible for uh, certain 
specialized actors, but uh, I'm trying to remember there was a story about it not too long ago about certain subs being able to get down to depth and capture those. And I swear it was a Russian sub, but I could be wrong. It might have been ours. Yeah, I, I read the same, actually, that it was a Russian sub, that they captured it on sonar, like hovering above, you know, for however long it, it, it could. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. When it comes to these black ops or, you know, government programs, we don't hear about it. You know, even though we work in this industry and we understand cybersecurity, what they do, they they don't publicly announce it. So if that technology is there, there are certain state actors who would benefit greatly from harvesting massive amounts of data that they can filter through for years and, and figure out what's what or what's valuable, what's not valuable. Um, but it would make sense that they would want that data and they would try to do that. And the fact that these ghost ships have been mapping, you know, who knows what points of vulnerabilities or, or, or what testing they've done for this. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a scary scenario all the way around. At, at the same time, I think that in Europe, they are uh, quite aware of which country has history of tapping underground cables. Uh, undersea cables. Uh, you can start by looking at Operation Ivy Bells. What was the operation? Operation Ivy Bell. Ivy Bells. Yeah, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, U.S. Navy uh, tapping Soviet undersea cables during Cold War. And uh, then you sort of extrapolate that uh, technology a few decades. I think, uh, John, I think at this point uh, we should probably wrap up with any final thoughts on that because I know it's probably A, getting pretty late where you are and yeah. uh, whatnot. So any final thoughts from everyone on the the cables that we didn't talk about? Like I just put in there, like, let's not forget about the real threat, sharks. There was a, a video taken of, of sharks like biting at the internet. It's like, hey, and of course the obvious joke is that's oh, just wire shark. It's fun. <laughs> wire, wire shark is in promiscuous mode. <laughs> but any final thoughts on that? No, I mean other, you know, other than just the obvious of it's an underlying threat that most people don't think about. You know, it's this kind of thing like, oh, no one would do that. Um, but we live in strange times. I mean, yeah, it's fair. Yeah. Did we, did we lose Jeremiah? Uh, we, all today. Oh, my, oh my we lost him for a second. We heard this is strange times and then that's all we can. Uh, can you hear me now? I yes. can hear you now. We heard yeah, strange my, my earbuds finally died. That's how we know we've done a, a good talk when, when they've right. completely died, both sides. Um, <laughs> So, no, if you think about it, there's a major war in Europe. You know, these were all things that 10 years ago, five years ago, two years ago, we never thought about. Um, and the risk of escalation, the risk of NATO being involved, you know, these, these are all very serious risks. And we also have become a technology-based society. I mean, we depend on technology for everything. And when you think about it in that way, it's not just the cable breaking or we're going to fix it. Like you were saying, with the energy grid, if the energy grid goes down and we lose access to information technology, we're going to find ourselves in a very strange place. So, I mean, that's kind of my final thought. And I'm glad that we you know, went into over overtime uh, just to discuss that because it's a it's a good talking point. It's a good thing to research and think about for later. Awesome. Is that where we want to end, everybody? More thought needed. All right. Very good. So, again, for those of you who stuck around for a little bit to, to talk about that issue, 
Uh, very much appreciated. For those of you who are still listening in, thank you again for sticking around. For those of you who are uh, out in Central Europe or uh, you know uh, a little further uh, to the east, thank you for joining us. I know it's probably getting pretty late there, dinner time or later. So please enjoy your meals. Thank you for joining. Hopefully we'll do another one of these soon, and we'll we'll maybe do some of those uh, non English language ones. Uh, even as I'm thinking about, it, I'm like, man, it'd be really cool to do a uh, a fire talk where it's an hour long talk. Uh, introduction is in English, but then you do the the talk in your your native language, and then uh, and then do the same talk immediately after in, in English, so we can share it with lots of audiences. So we'll think about that. And we'll talk about that more. But until next time. Thank you, all of you, for joining, and uh, hopefully we'll have another, uh, you know, European uh, meetup hangout talk again soon. So, again, for myself, Ian Meyer, Black Hills Information Security, and all the fine folks on the screen, Ryan, kill it with fire, if you wouldn't mind.